Welcome, Bastronauts. This is Teal's Bass Galaxy, an endless dimension of fishing legends and degenerates connecting through raw, real, in-person conversations and stories. No, this is not your average fishing podcast. There's no rules. There's no limits. Three, two, one, blast off. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Teal's Bass Galaxy is now offering intergalactic merchandise. That's right. We got apparel now, baby. Check out our website. We got a variety of apparel. Hats, bucket hats, sweatshirts, t-shirts, you know. All, all the finest goods. So stop on our website, tealsbassgalaxy.com, click on the apparel tab, and start looking good, baby. It's been confirmed. Aliens from another planet have landed on Earth. Sources say there's been two confirmed landing points for these extraterrestrial beings, one being Japan, and also, unexpectedly, in Minnesota, at Waypoint Angler Supply a local tackle shop on Lake Minnetonka. With the ever-expanding universe, it's no surprise that there are other planets out there that also share our love for the sport of bass fishing. And to Earth's surprise, this latest visit came from extraterrestrial fishermen light years away and many innovations ahead when it comes to fishing equipment. Some hypothesize these beings came from the planet of Naboo matching up with Mayan folklore dating back thousands of years with fishing equipment ahead of their time. It has been confirmed they left things never seen before by an Earth-born bass. Waypoint Angler Supply is the premier space station in the Bass Galaxy and has tackle that could previously only be found in Japan or the planet of Naboo. The Waypoint ship is full, but we don't know when the astronauts from Naboo will be back. So hurry in to Waypoint Angler Supply today and stock up on that Area 51 Planet of Naboo JDM good good before your buddy is whooping that sweet ass of yours. Stop into their store on Lake Minnetonka or visit their website, waypointanglersupply.com. That's waypointanglersupply.com. Use the code GALAXY0124 to save 20% on your next tackle binge. The Bass Galaxy is also supported by Veselka Fishing and Customs, Supreme Lending, Dream Team, Lake Country Insurance Services, My Wedge Motor Support, Supreme Lure Company, just north of Memphis, barbecue and catering. Thank you. All right, we're both in the in the zone. Zoned in zoned in this is a little little weird hearing myself in my ears right it's kind of <laughs> like going into a new dimension mr lofenberg <laughs> and cheers dude thank you so much we actually uh for the folks who don't know we went bass fishing today how epic was that you brought your flat bottom up it was pretty epic we had to do some a uh, little bit sandy river at things we maybe put a few dings in the prop but caught some bass caught some walleye caught just about everything there there is that lives out there so well, it just seems fitting that when Kate Loffenberg comes up that we do river rat things and uh, hit a few rocks today. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we did. You know, I can't read the rock the rock seams the way I can read sand seams, but we got we got where we needed to go and back. So, dude, I had a blast, dude. We got to catch some bass. They they were a little stingy today, but we caught a, we got to catch some bass. But um, I'm really just excited to have you out. I've looked up to you, and I've I've been watching you from from afar kind of like through facebook and stuff and it's been really cool to see you progress and and have the su- and have the success you have down on the river dude so i want to give you hella props and i'm honored to have you up here and thanks for making the trip i appreciate it aaron i mean i'm honored to be here and i'm glad you uh thought of me 
you know, we, we've got talking about this a little bit last year, ended up not making it work. Uh, just things get busy, you know, tournament season comes up and gets crazy, but I'm just really glad we able to, we were able to make this happen. And likewise to you, you know, you see all these trophies back here. I've been watching you for a few years myself and seeing what you're doing here in Minnesota. It's pretty impressive as well. So it's good to have two bass and mines come together. And I think we both, you know, taught each other a few little tricks and maybe a few baits, little sneaky things today that we can both take and put into our arsenal. So I definitely picked up a few things. So like I was, yeah, my goal is to be a sponge today. And I, I think I've talked to a few river guys and I think the river is just something super special in how it trains an angler to make decisions on the water. And I guess, uh, definitely want to get into like a lot of that today, but like, how'd you get I don't know, like, your full story. We we got to talking a little bit about, you know, your master of custodial arts and, you know, <laughs> shit like that. But, like, where did, bat, like, you and bass fishing begin? That's that's a good one. I mean, bass fishing and I collided when I was at a pretty young age, and it was by complete accident. I mean, uh, my parents had a little river boat. It was like a 1980-something. We called it the Booger because it was freaking like this yellow just horrible looking thing it was literally the booger and uh my parents would take us out on the river on the weekends and you know the girls i have two sisters they would swim in the water and my mom would sunbathe whatever my dad and i would just throw a nightcrawler out the back of the boat and we got to catching random shit you know sheephead catfish whatever didn't matter i mean i was hooked from that moment i think i was probably three four years old you know yeah. when, when that was really going down and uh somehow you know it was just watching tv in the mornings was really what triggered the whole deal um i found bass masters i mean you hear the story from so many different people and it was me to a t you know tnn bass masters watching kevin van dam and what really stands out to me is 2003 i was like fifth grade or something you know seeing takahiro omori win that classic i mean it was the most incredible moment that i've ever seen in 03. fishing i, I think it was oh four i think oh it was oh four yeah oh three was iconelli yep. only reason i remember is because i i was a similar age anyway yeah Did and i i actually am, i'm actually embarrassed with myself for for getting that wrong be. because i'm <laughs> i'm a super fan of the sport so i shouldn't be making that kind of simple mistake hey, but man, we're getting older <laughs> and like that i mean dude i know you just blend together no i didn't mean to call you out on that no i deserved it i i appreciate I if you keep you calling me the same out. thing for me good in, good and I know you know your shit. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, well, I yeah. Mean I mean, take you off your track. No, no, it's all good. I can get right back on the track. That's what we try to do out fishing, and that's what we're going to do here. And uh, I mean, it just, it just all came together. Like watching the show is like, I want to do that. Like that is freaking amazing. Um, and it just turned into like, hey mom, hey dad, like, can you buy me this crankbait? You know, we went to Ace Hardware. I remember my first artificial lure. It was a ugly ass green bill dance bomber like deep diving crankbait like something that really had no place on the river but i didn't know anything then you know i thought it looked cool to me so i wanted it never did catch a fish on that um but eventually started buying more shit and eventually finally caught my first fish on a artificial lure and the rest is kind of just history i was just obsessed with it um when i turned 12 i was determined to get a boat because i had been fishing offshore and I knew that I needed to be out away from the shore and get away from all the people. And Where were you fishing from shore? Or where, I guess, where is this place yes, you were fishing from shore? That's a good point, yes. Nope, you're good. Uh, Goose Island, it's, if okay. you're familiar with Pool 8 of the Mississippi River, just south of La Crosse, Wisconsin, Goose Island is kind of like one of the major areas where things go down. You know, when, when the Elite Series tournaments come to La Crosse, like, you hear a lot about Goose Island because it's, a maze of backwater sloughs, like just tons and tons of sloughs. And you can really get lost if you don't know what you're doing down there. And that's where I grew up fishing. Um, there's a lot of access points from the shore. So I, I learned how to fish by fishing offshore in Goose Island. And then it transitioned into, I was 12 years old. Um, I actually put out a flyer to everyone in my neighborhood um, where my parents raised me. I basically said, hey, I want to get a boat and I'm willing to mow your lawn or do anything, you know, just, I, I think I even had like a wage on there, like $8 an hour or something or $7 an hour. Um, one of my neighbors called me up and said, Hey, I'll do it. Um, 
I'll give you six fifty an hour. <laughs> he was he yeah, was yeah. he was a penny pincher, you know. And You're I was like, lawns, though? oh yeah, Sick. mowing That's lawns, hauling yeah. brush, just whatever I could possibly do. And I saved up five hundred dollars um, that summer in like basically four or five months of just working my ass off. At least I thought I was working my ass off. Now I, I probably worked like five hours a week. But oh, we were little bitches. For yeah, sure. exactly. I'm, I was like, right there with you, but yeah, I mowed lawns. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you Ex- felt felt good to make money though. exactly and point. and i i'm really happy that my parents kind of instilled that into me like you know you see a lot of people and i'm not judging anybody but you know some people kind of they they develop a passion and their parents support it and just kind of buy them everything they need to do it my parents kind of taught me that hey if you want to do this we support it but you're gonna have to earn it and so i did that i bought that 12 foot boat um, my dad helped me go and make the sale you know the guy actually gave us a break on it because he realized what the hell is a 12 year old kid saved up this money you know i think he had it listed for 700 bucks and he sold it to me for the five that i had and that got me started and it was just i mean every day my dad would in the summertime my dad went to work nine to five he'd drop me off at the landing at eight and he'd pick me up when he got home from work to take me home for dinner and it was like that pretty much every day and then it got to the point where I, I played football in high school, so my dad would take me to football practice, drop me off with my bike, and I would bike home, which was seven miles from the school. Well, it's probably three and a half, four. Either way, a good bike ride. Yeah, yeah. I would bike home because there was my mom was gone, my dad was working, um, and no one was there to give me a ride. So I would literally bike home from football practice down to where my boat was left for me because my dad would take it down, drop it in the morning. We'd go. I, I'd go to practice, and then I'd bike back to where my boat was and go fish until he was done with work, come pick me up. Sure, sure. I mean, I did that so many times. Um, and that that's just, I learned all those slews that, you know, growing up, when you're fishing from shore, it all seemed like so crazy. Like, there's, there's no way I'm going to learn all this stuff. But after years and years of just covering every inch of it, you do learn it all. And, you know... There's not very many stones unturned left in Goose Island now after, you know, 20 some years of doing it. But that's really how I got started, you know. And as I got older, I got into a junior bass club and, you know, was able to fish and do good in a couple tournaments. And then turned 17 and I went and fished a co-angler event and won it out in Detroit, Michigan. So it was a, the old Strand Series, which is now the Toyota Series. Um, and so I was kind of like, oh, I'm kind of the man is what I thought back then, you know, a lot of people thought I was pretty arrogant and rightfully so, you know, I, I had all this success right out of the gate, but luckily for me, I mean, looking back at it all, I got my ass kicked after that. Once I got that boat and I went boater right away, you know, I jumped the ladder. Uh, Mark Zona talks about how you got to work the steps of the ladder to build yourself as an angler. And I jumped a few rungs right away because I had that success and I tried to tried to get ahead of myself with it and I got my ass absolutely freaking pounded in my home water like three different times and I quit fishing BFLs like I'm like I can't do this you know and that was the best thing that ever happened to me because it brought me back down to earth and then I went to college and had some success fishing there um still probably a little bit arrogant I will say in college but when you get those little pieces of humble pie throughout the course of your career it it makes you more reflective and you come back to it and you make better decisions you make better relationships with people and I really think that um my story is a little bit of a redemption story just from a moral personal aspect I think I've become a lot better person than I was when I was first growing up because of you know that early success gave me that high ego and then getting humbled back a little bit helped me to now where I can have success and confidence without maybe being so overconfident and um it's just really helped me i guess the last several years fishing like local bfls and somewhat you know regional level tournaments and that kind of thing you know you never get too big for your britches it's kind of the philosophy that i try to operate on now um there's a lot of really good fishermen out there and anybody can beat you any any given day so but i'm very thankful for how things have been going well you made pretty a pretty impressive name for yourself down on the river and beyond but i know if there's a bfl you're doing pretty good and if i remember correctly you won a phoenix boat not too long ago 
Yeah, 2020. I mean, the warranty's yeah. up on the damn thing, so it's been a while now. Sure. Um, but yeah, it was that was a really fortunate tournament, BFL regional in lacrosse, and yeah, I had to go fish in Illinois to qualify for it and made it happen, and was fortunate to win it. Um, but you know, you're you know how it is in in any competitive sport, you're only as good as your last tournament, and you know those wins are amazing, but you find yourself just kind of always it's never enough, right? You just always want more. Oh, yeah. You want to win yeah. again and put another piece of hardware up there on the, you want. on the waypoint wall. So it, it's just how it is, you know? I'm just yeah. always fighting to get better. Dude, that's – it's a constant evolution of that, and it's a, the beauty of the sport is, I mean, at 83 or 130, depending on how advances in modern science, like, you know, I'm still hoping to be learning about bass fishing, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, um, so like those early days when you were bassing, I want to like, do you remember the story like about your first ever light bulb moment, like fishing either from shore on the river or in your boat, like where you, cause you know, the, that river is full of light bulbs that, oh yeah. do you like, do you remember what that was like? Or do you remember that first time you kind of understood like, oh, if I do this here, this goes down, like. I think maybe one With of like them, like a lure, or, you know. It was it early was early day stuff. I mean, it was a combination of baits and technique, but more than anything, it was really understanding a movement of fish. That was when the light bulb really first went off, and I think it really fueled my desire to like dig into it and really become obsessed with it. I had a place down on on the shore of Goose Island, and <clears throat> I don't even really know. I kind of stumbled into it because I was just trying to fish everywhere I could I'd ride my bike and put a couple rods in a backpack and zip them and tie the zipper together. I feel like that's it. I see kids all the time. I mean, I, that's nothing new. Like everybody does that when you're a kid, you got to like secure the rods, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, but I had this place that I found and it was a place where a backwater kind of bottlenecked the current into a narrow section and the current kind of just funneled through there. And then, <clears throat> I mean, I didn't have any way to tell how deep it was, but you got the sense from the bank, the steeper banks on one side and flatter stuff on the other side. You could kind of tell that there must be some sort of a drop in, in there, you know. And I just, early June, I absolutely hammered them there one time. And for like two weeks straight, I'd be going back down there every night after school and just blistering them. Which, of course, for the time it was blistering them, it's still, it was still a good spot, but... Obviously, there's better stuff now, but at the time, I was catching, like, seven keeper bass in a night of fishing, and that was like, oh, my God, I'm on fire, you know? And what it ended up being, you know, I would constantly think, like, why are these fish here? What's going on? And what I came to realize was that, hey, there's a spawning bay, like, just above, just upstream from this place, and they're funneling down through here. These They're all post-spawn. They had bloody tails and stuff. And if you drug something on the bottom, you could feel a little bit of like bump, 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 like something's hard on the bottom. Okay, they're coming out of their spawning area. They're using the current to funnel out of here, and they're making their way out to deeper, faster moving current water to recuperate from the spawn. And I mean, that was the first epiphany moment where it's like these fish are moving out of an area, going somewhere else. It's like a transitional period. And I think I was in like seventh grade when I figured that out. And, and from there, it was just like, let's go. I, I think I understand how to follow these fish now, you know, because I, I knew yeah. where they were coming from. I didn't fully grasp where they were going, but I, I felt confident that I could figure that out if I had that boat, you know, yep. and then it all, well, I guess by then I did have the boat, but I didn't get to use it all the time, especially during like the school week, you know, so it was one of those deals where it's like, I can't wait for the weekend so I can get out in the boat and try to figure out these fish more, you know? And, right, right. And that's the real, I think that spot was really the real turning point for me. What was like your, the front deck at that point? Cause I know my front decks evolved like. Oh gosh. Tenfold compared to, you know, seventh grade, dude. I think it was <laughs> seventh grade, man. Holy smokes. Well, the I front. Mean, I had like three bait casters, baby. Or like two, maybe. Maybe one. I don't even know. The Not front, many. The front deck of this boat was like the size of the area where my trolling motor's mounted on my bass boat. Oh, yeah. This was a 12-foot little tin boat, Heck like yeah. V-bottom. Yeah, I mean, the whole boat was the size of my front deck of my Phoenix. So, yeah, the Weaver Bottoms <laughs> apprenticeship boat. Yeah, yes. I mean, it has evolved 
immensely for sure. And I mean, I always try to keep that in mind, like as you level up in life, right? You get a better truck, you get a better boat, you get a better place of living, all this stuff. Um, try to think back to when I was 12 and fishing out of that boat and didn't have a care in the world. And I thought nothing was holding me back. I never looked at other boats and like, oh man, they're so much better than me because they've got a better boat. I never thought like that. I would have killed to have the boat I have now. And I try to keep that in perspective. You know, if you ever feel that way on the water, I always try to channel that to other people too. Cause sometimes, you know, you're, you're on Facebook and you read comments and stuff and you see people talk about, you know, there, you definitely see some boat insecurity out there. Like, Hey, I'm thinking about fishing a BFL. I've got a 18 foot nitro. It's a 2001 with a 150. Is that a be- good enough boat to fish the tournament? And I, I just, I feel bad for those people that they even feel that way. It's like, yeah, if they knew it, all of most of that, that most of our dicks are small, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. know, maybe they would think differently if they just knew that our, everybody else's dicks are probably as right. small as they are. <laughs> even the guy that caught know? 20 pounds, he's got the micro penis. Yeah, I mean, for sure, man. Christmas light. <laughs> all right. I didn't expect that to go that direction, but I'm here for it, bud. Hey, welcome to the galaxy. <laughs> uh, so like. I, I remember the first couple lures that I'd like got confidence in, you know, a buzz bait, a spinner bait, uh, uh, tube and a jig, I think were like four of them for me, I guess. Do you remember on the river, like what your first freaking oh, yeah. stuff was? Piece of cake it is a swim jig. I mean, <laughs> and it's funny cause I mean, I, I don't consider myself to be a swim jig aficionado by any means at this point in my fishing career. Um, but at that time growing up, Everybody looks for role models. My role model was Jim Johnson, um, still a lacrosse legend. I mean, still kicking ass in tournaments. I still talk to him all the time. We fish together um, from time to time. And um, growing up, he was winning everything, you know. And I looked up to him, and I knew he was doing a lot of his work on a swim jig. Um, And so that's what I wanted to throw was a swim jig. Tried all kinds of different brands. It didn't seem to matter. It was just about what you're doing with your rod and how you're fishing it and what you're fishing it around and the weight of it and all that. And I learned all that stuff just from being out there, you know, but yeah, hands down. I mean, pretty much had a swim jig in my hand most of the time, just going fishing, learning everything. River staple. Yeah. I mean, and slowly over time, you know, the frog was getting more publicity. Um, the Dean Rojas effect, you know, back then he was winning tournaments on Kermit, which we found out was the Spro bronze eye and you know i got some of those and really sucked at it you know yeah i missed like every fish that bit i actually started throwing moss bosses you know the uh, old moss dude, bo- yes, and i, I, I love i love them because when one bit it i pretty much usually caught them for sure and so, it, go, it went it went through everything so all that shit that i couldn't get through it went through yes it. yeah if there's any moss, kids moss balls. If there's any kids listening which maybe you shouldn't be because of you know the micro penis and stuff we were talking about but the kids will be fine <laughs> all right i agree the teachers are teaching them more shit <laughs> they got tiktoks <laughs> yeah no Instagrams. shit yeah this stuff i see on tiktok i don't want to we do a disclaimer old. before the show now okay. this podcast oh. is intended for mature audiences do you only. do it with like the south park like font uh cole throws some shit in there i forget <laughs> okay uh, i forget what it looks like but it you know want to let the people know okay. you know it, like no surprises here that's good yep, i like this it is, yep this is not designed for kids you know if kids watch hey parents you know maybe maybe, maybe you have a better eye on what your kids are watching if you're not cool <laughs> with with that so yeah okay there's an explicit sign too next to it on the podcast so you know we're not fucking around <laughs> All right. I'm just kidding. Well, I'm going to wait a little bit to drop my first F-bomb, but we're going to get there. Dude, yeah. I mean, the people who care only watch for like the first 20 minutes. So okay, 21 minutes, we're after, dropping the Fs. After a half hour or so, you're good. And usually I've, I've got you covered. So if you don't say one, I, I'll probably cover you. But I try not. It depends on the day. Some right. days you swear more than others. Have you noticed that? Yeah. It's weird. I don't swear the same amount every day. Like some days I don't swear at all. Sometimes I swear a lot. Sometimes I wonder if I swear in my sleep. Dude. Probably do. Dreams are trippy, dude. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember your dreams? Yeah, sometimes, especially when it's like really shitty. Really? I had a couple bad ones last night, actually. I'm not getting into it, but didn't like them. 
Dude, isn't that weird? I think weird? it's the melatonin. I pounded two melatonins when I left work last night because I, I knew I had to get up at 3.45, which is asinine for me. And Yeah. So the melatonin just... Well, they say that that's like a, you know, a key to the lock of... of of demons, the box <laughs> of demons. Like you might have, you might have called some shit in. But like when we're asleep, I don't remember anything. But I wish I could consciously dream every night before our tournament. So yeah, I could, there's people that can know, lucid dreaming is a thing. It's a thing. Imagine if you could do that and just like channel yourself like to fishing in your dreams, so you could just fish while you're alive or awake, and then fish while you're asleep, and then just like wake up and eat, and then just fish, and then go back to fishing when you go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it went. It was a whisper one, but <laughs> it's, a whis- it's a whisper. But it, whisper. it counts. ASMR. It c- count it. ASMR. <laughs> but like, dude, that takes the word like eat, sleep, fish to a new level. Like the we need to the tap disclaimer into this. is is maybe eat the, fish, fish. But like maybe that. that's what Wheeler's doing or something. Hmm. Dude, do you like? There'd be less divorces if people could do that. You're right, because then you could cut back down on the real fishing part. Your wife doesn't even know you're fishing. You're gonna definitely, <laughs> you're definitely gonna catch bigger ones too. You know, way oh, bigger. No ones. doubt. Like, like you're never gonna catch a dink again. Yeah, dude, your confidence going into them derbies is like all time <laughs> high. I caught four ten pounders last night. <laughs> yeah, in your dreams. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh wow! You didn't. Dude, I I consciously dreamed one time, and as soon as I flew, I woke up. <laughs> it's like the first thing I did was like, "Ooh, I <laughs> wake up!" Damn, you were just getting to the good stuff. I know. I was like, "We just got here. We just getting started." <laughs> but... How many? How many uh, impressions can you do? Because I heard, I heard some uh, Aussie today. I heard some Donald Trump. That was good. China, China. And now you current got... seams. I I love current seams. Current seams. I fished two billion current seams they're last bring, year alone. They're bringing bass. They're bringing shad. Current seams. <laughs> they're bringing sucker minnows. <laughs> they're bringing slip bobbers. They're bringing lindy rigs. We need to build the wall. <laughs> we need to build it large. We need to build it tall. Holy shit. Oh. Yes. Starting at the Monticello warm water discharge. <laughs> all the way down to Ellison Park. <laughs> I talked to Tim Wells. He said no. He said no. <laughs> that was impressive. I I no. You're lucky you got me. Usually I don't do well on the spot like that. So that was really impressive. But He's a good liar, folks. No, uh, I don't think so. No, but back gonna, that's to, gonna go viral. I wish. Uh, so <laughs> back to like uh, back to current seams. Uh, <laughs> so the evolution of so actually no, I know where I was going college dude you had a good run in college and you fished some college stuff like now you got college kids like fishing big shit and like i feel like you were on the beginning of the uptick of that so to speak and i know you and wyatt did pretty well in some of those if i remember right yeah no doubt wyatt stout and i we we went to a couple national championships together and definitely uh we won a couple conference championships which was pretty cool uh, we won one on Kentucky Lake and one on Carlisle Lake in Illinois. Absolute shithole. Don't go there, by the way. Sorry, uh, Illinois Parks and Rec or whatever. That place is brutal. But, yeah, it was it was a really good um, run that we had. We got to see a lot of fisheries that there's no way we would have been able to afford to go to. I mean, I was broke as hell, and so was Wyatt in college. I mean, oh, see, I, I think, mean, well, you're in college. Yeah, but you weren't a rich kid, right? I was gonna say, I mean, being in college does not qualify you to be poor. That's pretty evident. You weren't Tucker Smith. (laughs) Well, that kid's a freaking hammer, so I got nothing to say about that. But better be (laughs) for how much time he has on the water and how much guides they pay him for him. Jeez, you're really uh, getting after it here. I was told that you know, at the end of the day, you need to be yourself. That's how I feel. (laughs) He should be that good. I expect him to be. I can't tell if, if you have that much family money behind you and like that much, you know, time on the water. I expect him to be that good. You should be that good. Yeah, that's a fair point. Should be better. That's 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 kind of what I've always said. Anytime anybody's ever been like, no Cinderella story there. You're a good fisherman. You know, if anybody's ever said that to me, that's what I say to him too. It's like, well, I've dedicated my whole freaking life to this, so you should. If be I good. sucked at it, I'd be pretty. 
that'd be pretty pathetic, you know? Somebody that's, that spends every waking moment of their life thinking and dreaming and... Do you trailer your big outboard? Then you need the MyWedge motor support. MyWedge keeps even the heaviest motors safe and secure on the trailer. And talk about easy. Up with the motor, on with the MyWedge, back down and ready to roll. And MyWedge is built to last. It won't rot, it won't split, it won't fail. Guaranteed. Pop on My Wedge centering clips for lateral stability and you're good to go. My Wedge, security in a snap. To order yours, go to MyWedge.com. Supreme Lurico introduces a revolution in bass fishing with our triumphant trio. The Supreme Slug, Lil Slug, and Sla. Leading the charge is the Supreme Slug. A legend revived after two decades, its unique shape and built-in hook slot redefine tactical brilliance on the water giving you an edge like never before. But the saga continues with the Lil Slug, a miniature powerhouse that mirrors the majesty of the Supreme Slug. Don't let its size fool you. It packs the punch needed to lure in those elusive bass. And for the ultimate bass feast, there's the Slaw, a craw representation with the same irresistible characteristics as the Supreme Slug. It's bass seduction at its finest, designed to trigger predatory instincts. Exclusively crafted for bass enthusiasts, Supreme Lurico brings you a trio that's not just baits, they're bass magnets. Supreme Lurico, cast in gold, real in glory. Fishing, about fishing, um, if you sucked at it, that's that sucks. And I don't mean to blast the guy, but at the end of the day, I got to watch Father Gill beat him in the bracket, and that was cool, so, I, yep, we're good. Father Gill caught him today, too, it looked like, on Okeechobee, huh? Caught a nine-pounder or something? I need to see where he ended up. Finished uh, seventh, I think. Scott Dude. Martin caught another 30-pound bag, so. Seventh. How about that? First Bassman. It's <laughs> legit. First time on Lake Okeechobee. Kids for real. He texted me and said he was scoping them. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, he got seventh. Damn, almost sixty pounds for three days. Had two two days over twenty. But uh, any funny college stories from college fishing that you can remember? Well, well, hmm. well I got in trouble one time because we drank some beers. Got yelled at. Okay. For wow. Yeah. Were they? Were they? Did they know that you could go to war? Like. <laughs> You know what I mean? Well, see, that's Before, a, that's like, a, that was my point. I was I was twenty one, and everyone oh, well, we were all twenty one, but uh, we we got a little tore up one night and then lined them up along the wall and took a picture of the the wall of beer and it was on my personal Facebook page, but the school found out about it. Well, they knew. We like, got yelled it, at. You didn't drink all those. We were, like it was you and some people. That yeah, well, made. there's three of us that pounded probably like twenty beers. I mean. It was, yeah, I mean, it's, the day. it's a doable I mean, thing. I mean, you're in college. It's acceptable at a Lutheran school. I don't know about a Catholic school. <laughs> well, I was at a public school, Actually, but they German had a, Catholic they had a policy, fine. I guess, when you're representing the university that you have to follow certain guidelines. Of Winona? Know. Yeah. Yeah. They know it's Winona, right? Sometimes I think they forget. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they should watch. So their, that was they that should sucked, check their but... nurses' Facebook pages, see how those look. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not like we used the school money to buy the alcohol. I bought the alcohol, and I was legal to buy it. And we were in middle of bumfuck Egypt, in Arkansas. <laughs> this old guy, the old couple that owned this hotel, they were like ninety. It's not like you stacked them on the dash of your pickup and took a picture. Right. You know, like, <laughs> While we're driving, <laughs> going 100. <laughs> yeah, no, we safely consumed these. Yeah. Well, good. yeah, this this place, I mean, this it was like a 90-year-old old lady and old man, and we called down there, hey, we're looking to get a room for this time, per, time frame. We were actually pre-practicing for a tournament because it was our spring break, so we were just like down there scouting the lake. It was Beaver Lake in Arkansas, and this guy's like, well, we're closed for the season, but, you know... We can open it up for you. And we came down there, this guy, I mean, the, bless his heart. They opened up the whole fucking hotel just for us three guys. Well, we I got a moonshine still yeah. down. I mean, it was awesome. We had a whole hotel to ourselves, and there That's was like, up. we like never saw another person like the whole week, other than like out on the water. There's like two people bass fishing. 
that were also like pre-practicing for the tournament and we smashed spotted bass and largemouth and mean mouth and small mouth like beaver lake was like the most fun trip i ever took in college for like just going to pre-practice i mean it was when the alabama rig was was new it was 2013 so it only had like one spring under its belt oh they never seen that <laughs> i mean we, baits at one time we blistered them man i mean we caught uh my college partner at the time sam he caught one over i think it was just under six on Damn. the a rig on beaver you know and i mean we we would have had like 17 pounds that day for five i mean it was so much fun um and they they had a flw tour event like the week after we were there and there was a 23 pound bag caught i mean fishing was good at Hell beaver yeah. during the a rig phenomenon but anyway i don't know i guess kentucky i don't have any was good that time i remember i went to kentucky lake like that second year and it was just like I didn't know shit, and I was catching three pounders everywhere on like a rig. It was crazy. Yeah, imagine if it just stayed like that forever, and then you put live scope, and so you just catch like two hundred bass a day on an a rig and live scope. Right. Then Randy Block, it would really be pissed. Yeah, dude, we don't even use the term enough, but like, like taking them to school, like, <laughs> we literally take them bass to school every day. <laughs> yeah. To an extent, mm-hmm. they're still pretty dumb, but. The fish we fish for today have been, they've been schooled. <laughs> for sure, man. Well, lacrosse, I mean, you being in lacrosse, you can probably speak firsthand about how that place has changed based on the pressure because you've you've gone from not seeing any major national tournaments on lacrosse yeah. to Todd Faircloth winning out of the box and it not being as good no more and, like, all of that stuff, you know? The box itself is more than just being exposed. Like, the box is still a fertile area. Talking about Stoddard, um, that area just totally went through a total, like, vegetation change. Like, silted in some. Sure. Um, the wild rice on the north end of the box kind of took over and changed the flow pattern through there. And then um, there used to be tons and tons of lily pads, lotus pads, yeah. the big giant elephant ear pads. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those just got choked out by junk weed. And never came back. So, like, Stoddard is, it, the complexion of Stoddard is, like, way different. It's still... Low water and then silt? High high and low water? Like, combination, you think? Yeah. It? Yeah, I think so. And, and just, a re-intro- like, an introduction of some different vegetation that, you know, for whatever reason, decided to start growing in those areas. Like, the wild rice, when I was growing up, you know, the stories I was telling earlier about fishing on shore and stuff, there wasn't wild rice in the river, like, anywhere. At least... Yeah. I mean, there maybe was, like, a couple tufts of it somewhere here or there, but I never saw it. And then it was, like, I don't, I can't put my finger on which year it really took off, but maybe 10 years ago now, it just exploded on the river. And it's totally changed the dynamics of the river. Like, huh. it took me about three, four years to even start to think about catching a bass out of the shit because I hated it. Like, despised it. And, you know, sometimes it's laying over halfway, sometimes it's sticking straight up and you throw a frog in there and like, no matter how tight you get your hook to the body of the frog, it would get, you'd get a blade on there and screw up your cast. And, you know, now I've definitely found ways to use it to my advantage, but it's changed the river and it's, it's filled in some areas because that rice, when it gets real thick, you know, it creates like a wall, yeah, like a thick wall. Probably deflects, like it deflects the current. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like that elephant. St- it's not as tough as like elephant grass stems, but it's or pencil reeds. But it it it's tighter. Mm-hmm. It grows tighter yes. together. So that's probably what. Yeah. Yeah. When you get a gigantic like three football field size patch of rice all stacked together, it's really moving water around it, um, and so. What happens is all the area below that, you know, down current of that fills in and it, it basically creates an island over time. Like there's places out there that are building, it started with rice and then sand starts to pile up on the rice. Sure. And, and then, you know, through the siltation and the detritus of dead plants starting to form soil, we're literally seeing islands forming out Do you think in that the river. rice will eventually get covered by the sand, like where it'll eventually just create a you know, a sand rice paddy drop? I mean, it, it definitely is always moving and shaking. I mean, what I see is a lot of times the rice will grow right on the edge of a sand drop. So, yes, over time, the sand's going to push further into that rice. Right, right. But I feel like 
it just kind of pushes the rice further down. Just moves the rice patch. What I'm seeing is rice is the rice is really encroaching. Like the rice really grows a lot on some of the open flats on the south ends of these pools. Sure. And it started at the very tops of those flats where the sandbars come in to that slacker water. And like that was like 10 years ago when you're starting to see a lot of rice forming in those I guess you could call it like a delta area. Yeah. The rice was starting to build up in those deltas. Did that but, replace something else that was there? Like eelgrass? Like, cause to me, eelgrass is kind of what pops up on a lot of them. Yeah. Type of on the spot, flats. Yeah. From my experience. Anyway. It's, it's definitely cutting into eelgrass areas. And I mean, it's taken up like you don't see as much coontail and milfoil and all the good stuff in those areas for sure. Like it do you over like the rice or do you not like it? It's it's a love hate for sure. sure. I mean, there's situations that I look for involving the rice that are good. I mean, one thing the about current deflection, factor. current deflection, current coming through it, like through the yeah. whole body of it. Yeah, yeah. One thing about rice that is very um, nice. Uh, the one nice property of it is that it does seem to filter the water quite well. Um, so when there's a lot cleaner, of it, if you if you got some you got sparse spots on the back sides of it, yeah, yeah. If you got that current pulling through it yeah yeah. but you got to find the right spot and it's got to be right and the water level's got to be right and you know there's a lot of factors at play there you know water rising water falling that creates different scenarios too like if the water's coming through the rice patch and then starts rising that clean water that might have been coming through that rice might get pushed back yep because the water's now going into the rice instead of coming out of it it's just there's so many variables there like it's i couldn't even begin to scratch the surface of it but what about the, like the pressure though and like fish because you've had there's that place gets blasted now yeah it seems like compared comparatively speaking and you've got fish being moved lock to lock pool to pool like where are all the weigh-ins they're all in lacrosse right <laughs> pool so, eight so okay pool so. eight's always got the most i think the the best population of largemouth bass of just about any pool on the river. I would I would really argue that. I wonder why. Yeah. Well, it's already an amazing pool. Like, sure. take all the tournaments away. Pool 8, you know, you look at a map, look at the spawning areas, look at the wintering areas. Right. Look at the acres of grass, all that stuff. Um, and even just going from one pool to the next, you go down to pool 9, look at the watercolor on Google Earth. It's dirtier. Like, pool 8 is, like, the biggest pool with the cleanest water, with the most grass, with the most spawning and wintering areas. So it can, you know, the carrying capacity of that pool is just phenomenal. Then you got the Black River, which sets up like a mini Kentucky Lake. It's just a totally different deal that those fish can be residential in there. They kind of get um, offshore in there a little bit, yeah, don't they? Yeah, they, they do at times. If I remember right. And it's a sanctuary for those release fish, too. I mean, the those tournaments release them a lot of times in the black area. And yep. I mean, it just can, continuously end, right? restocks right, kind of where it funnels in it depends you know the the release boat sometimes takes them back out to the mississippi which i prefer but you know they take them north too and dump them right in the middle of the black too but to get back to your point about the frog fishing or just the the pressure in general the point i wanted to make was it really has impacted the frog bite on the mississippi like growing up you know 2008 really stands out as a year that was like mind-bogglingly good like that was like the last frontier of the really true like prolific legendary storied mississippi river bass fishing that you hear about and you know in 2012 like todd faircloth showed that to the world when he was catching like 40 fish out of one little patch on a frog that's how it used to be like 2008 like you could go out and catch 50 a day on a frog like all summer long like, there wasn't a, a lull until the first 30 degree night in October you know then they stop eating the frog a little bit but now frog fishing is more like I like to compare it to ledge fishing frog fishing is the ledge fishing of the Mississippi River you know when the grass grows up they're post spawn it's finally getting to be summer that's when they really rush the mats you know like late June early July that's when you can expect the frog bite to heat up you know the traditional frog bite there's always a spawning fish frog bite, you know, a post-spawn, like, wood and overhanging grass frog bite. But that's, what I'm talking about is the frog bite in duckweed, lily pads, like, the true slop frogging. 
And that has really just changed. It's evolved because of the pressure. Those fish see so many damn frogs because that's what people... <coughs> bless you. Excuse me. Bless you. <coughs> Gesundheit. <laughs> that's what people drive 10 hours to come to lacrosse and pass all these other grade A fisheries on their way. Not but, in Iowa, but... Well, yeah, <laughs> you're right. You're right. But, but, you know, somebody driving up from Texas... Yeah. I've heard, I mean, there's people that do this. Like, lacrosse has become a destination fishery, believe it or not. We don't have 10-pounders. We don't even have hardly any 6-pounders. Right. But, but people want that frog bite. And as a result of that... And catch a number. Like, yeah. Like, they see in the... Like, and just the scenery yeah. is amazing with the bluffs and everything. I, not I the get women, it. but it's beautiful environment. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there's some beauties out there. There are. My girlfriend's sorry, you, one of them. Hey, you lacrosse beautiful women. I'm sorry. <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, over time, it's just as those fish get more exposed to the frogs, you know, it becomes tougher and tougher. And, and I've had to retool my whole tournament mindset around that fact. Uh, it used to be you'd go out and you'd have four or five, six different frog schools, you know, places where you expect to get multiple bites out of a very small area, frog fishing. That would be what I'd call a frog school, just like a Kentucky Lake ledge school back in the heyday of Kentucky Lake. Now... It's not about finding schools of frogfish. It's about finding a large area that seems to have better quality fish. And you're looking to dedicate at least two to five hours of your day hunting and pecking around that area, grinding your ass off to catch two, three, four good ones, like over three pounders. That's what it is now. Mm. It's tough, but the juice is worth the squeeze if you know what you're doing. And that's, you know, that's how I was able to, piece together a sixth place at that invitational last year was just being really focused and disciplined on that afternoon frog bite yeah i mean i caught um uh, back-to-back four pounders on that last day you know i didn't have much else to go with it but i knew that that was a high chance of happening it happened the day before as well two big ones late in the day yeah like, that's what you're doing now for frog fishing you're trying to get well, one two three good ones in more too and i guess like used to be able to just probably walk a frog around and just catch them, right? And now I mean, you probably have to think a little bit more about how you cast the frog, how you work the frog, which, you know, oh, this frog makes a little different noise than this frog. Oh, this frog's red or, you know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with pressure, I know for a fact that that's those little things become more of a player. Work instead of letting it sit when it goes to an opening, working it across the opening and letting it sit on the mat instead because they're used to seeing that freaking frog sit in the opening or exactly. whatever it might be. So I guess is there it? So how, along with the adjustment that you're talking about of picking apart, you know, an area more, what are some other adjustments like that you've had to make to, to frog fishing that have proven to be maybe more challenging yet effective? Yeah, a lot of it is just <clears throat> understanding that there are patterns within patterns, too. Um, so a lot of it boils down to one very specific type of vegetation. Like a lot of what I'm doing, frog fishing, revolves around duckweed. You know, I like to see some duckweed in the area. But then you get even deeper into that. And duckweed needs to have a certain consistency. Like when I talk about consistency, I'm talking about the thickness of the duckweed. Like there's just a prime it's little like pancakes, spot, right? Like, How do you like your pancakes? Yeah, well, How the do you bass, like your duckweed, the bass, Mr. Laufenberg? Yeah. Ah, do you like a crepe? Do you I like a very thin pancake? <laughs> or do you like a sick buttermilk oh, you're pancake? You're killing me. I'm done. <laughs> you're killing Answer the question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I like the duckweed that the bass are in. Same, same. <laughs> so it varies for sure. But like once you catch a few, that's the duckweed they're in right now. And then you need to find more of that right now. So but tomorrow that you're saying like you have a, like if if you're if you're catching them off crepes, you fucking running crepes. Yeah. Right. If you're yeah. Exactly. Them off buttermilk biscuits. You fucking running buttermilk biscuits. Exactly. That's what you're saying. <laughs> He's got it. He's got the analogy there. That's what's That's up, it. dude. It's it. I mean, it varies, and it, a lot of it's based on what's the water level doing, what's the water temperature doing, and then what's the forage doing. What what are they actually eating? You know. I mean, and I don't know. I'm not an expert. Like, I know there's more crayfish under those good. mats than you think. Really? For sure. 100%. I, mean, I did not know that. That I is can't a tell nugget. You. I mean, I'm not, like, seeing them, but, like, I catch a four-pound largemouth on a frog in this much water, and then at the end of the day, there's crayfish pinchers everywhere in my live well. 
I mean, maybe that fish ate them off some rocks and then swam five miles into no, this. No, no, no. They don't call them mud bugs for nothing. <laughs> exactly. Down in Louisiana. Yeah, exactly. And you in the Delta waters of Mississippi. So I'm sure all that plays a role. I mean, what's the whole ecosystem doing, right? It's all about understanding the whole ecosystem. And that's why I never ignore other things. Like, what, what are the other species of fish that are around me right now? And over time, you develop, you start to see that awareness of, oh, there's, there's a bunch of sheephead in here. The last time I found a bunch of sheephead in this area, caught some bass. Okay. Or, oh, there's a bunch of pike here. Like, just understanding the whole ecosystem, which I don't understand it, but it, there's that. Well, what have you learned from pike? Because that'd be a good one. I'd like to know what you've learned from when you catch pike in an area. What on the river? Because I've, I've been piked. Like, I've had some of my pike in an area that's super shallow in a river to me means the largemouth just left. It's yeah, my, I don't the analysis that I that I don't know, but that's all I can think of. I don't like pike at all. I, I don't hate I don't them bastards. I don't like them just in general, but I also don't like them when they're Worst. in an area Pickle that them I want to fish for bass. Yeah. The only thing I'll say is in the springtime I've seen a correlation at times largemouth fishing, you know, you're going to catch pike all over the hell, all over the place on the river. But if you catch a big pike like 35 plus, then I feel a little bit better about that. Like, I feel like big predator fish and big predator fish control areas together to a degree. I would agree with like that. Like a four that pound bass sense. is not scared of a 35 inch pike. Right. A two pound bass probably should be a little bit scared because I've seen some freaking big bass. Well, not big, but good sized bass being chomped on by a pike that size. Now, 55 inch musky. Everything's not safe. Yeah, nothing's safe. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. I understand, but we don't deal with many of them around us. Not too many, no. There's anyway, been, yeah. Back to the frogging though, and the and the biscuits <laughs> and the crepes. Yes, uh, yes. So, so you've learned a little bit with the duckweed. Has that always been a thing, or is that something that you've had to pay more attention to it's, as the pressures? It's always been a thing. Up? It's always been a thing. the 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 stuff I'm fishing has changed as far as the duckweed likes to get on something, right? Whether it's a tree. Uh, lily pads, rice, whatever. It's that's what it does. It sucks into something. You know, the current moves the duckweed around. Water levels changing moves duckweed around. But eventually, the duckweed finds a resting spot, and that's either on a mat of, you know, coontail, something that's holding it there. And so, what's holding it there has changed for me. But the consistency of the duckweed's always been like that. Like you found the right consistency of duckweed worked up into like some juicy pads. And that was money, like back in that 08 time frame. Like, I mean, you could catch, I, I remember counting 28 keeper bass out of one small patch of lily pads, and most of them were over two and a half. A few of them were over three and a half. That just doesn't happen anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Not saying that those kind of schools don't necessarily exist. They might exist, but you don't get more than two or three to actually eat a frog. And you might be able to get a few more punch in and whatever, yeah. Then you kind of just bust it all up, and you know, and that's if you got a really good place that no one's messing with. Right. So that's what I was kind of getting at there, but, but yeah, I mean, duckweed is part of the equation with the frog. A big part of it too, honestly, is just being more technical about my frog itself. Like, I now, you know, I used to only want run one frog rod and just, you know, pretty much just that's live and die, live and die with towards. with a black frog, you know, yeah, a black spro or strike king frog and now beautiful thing now it's like okay i got my black on i always do but then you know i'll mix in some natural red maybe i'll even throw a white one now and then and and then you know i do some other things with the tails well you know sure skirt around that a little bit well yeah, all right we're back back to our regular scheduled programming this is deals bass galaxy i'm here with Cade loffenberg and uh guess what frog fishing is not as easy on the mississippi river nowadays and so it used to be just a black sparrow frog and now you've got how many frog rods on the deck and i guess like do you factor in different so depending what type of water you're fishing right you got frogs that skip good and that are a little better open water frogs then you've got frogs that do the popping thing then you've got now these bladed frogs then you got yeah. this like waypoint makes us like sneaky one that tackle sprinkler frog like there's a the waypoint makes one no they ah sorry they carry oh they yeah, carry the sprinkler. it yep. in fact okay. uh that 
black one right up there. Mm. If have you ever thrown that one? I haven't thrown that exact one, but I've thrown similar ones. So it, it kind of gives off like it whopper plopper type sound yeah. through cover, and you can stop it. So to me, I feel like there's a time and place for that on the. It's time and place type bait. Definitely. But, but back to the question. There's still a question. Uh, <laughs> So I guess what, how technical have you gotten? And I guess what are like some little tidbits that I guess you would share? Cause for me, I think frog fishing is an art form. I, I respect it. And I am understanding that it's not like my greatest strength, but I've learned some things to combat like my weakness of it. Definitely. So I'm always curious about guys who are really in tune with it because there's, there's little nuances. There's, there's a lot of things to a frog that I think most people overlook. Yeah, I mean, for starters, with the two frog rods, like usually two frog rods is kind of what I stick with um, for summertime tournament fishing. It, and I'll usually have one that's just your standard walking frog. And then my second frog rod's either probably going to be a popping frog or it's going to be something I can reel, something that's either got tails on it or like the sprinkler type frog or uh, that, what's that one that Tackle makes with the little blades on it? Yeah, the bladed, yeah. That, I really like that frog. Um, ding, ta -da -ding, ta -da -ding, ta -ding. Yeah, when they're on that yes. frog, they're on that frog. Uh, but you also have to consider what kind of cover you're fishing. So, you know, Galaxy 20, you can save 20% on that frog. Nice. Okay. That, that <clears throat> popping frog isn't as be like isn't the best frog to come through thick duckweed. But if you got real thin duckweed or if you're fishing it, you know, if it's a cloudy day, or low light conditions, you know, a lot of times those fish are a little, they're not really hunkered down in one particular spot on the mat. They might be on the edges of it, you know, working around some open water, maybe chasing bait a little bit. And that's where I'll go to something that's imitating a shad or some, you know, a shine or some sort of bait fish type of frog that I can work around more sparse cover. But the other big thing, when you're fishing mats specifically, that's kind of what I'm really fit, talking about with the frog I mean, there's a million ways to fish a frog, but we're talking about mats. I like to look at different, like, for what consistency of cover I'm fishing, I'm going to vary the weight of my frog. And I can just, I can, you can use metal BBs, you can put um, rattles in them. Rattles can be a, a player sometimes. You know, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but just find a way to put a little bit more weight in your frog when you're fishing that thicker cover. For one, it helps that bait have a better presence in the mat. You know, it's going to sink it down a little bit. So when you move the bait, you're moving more water. Sure, you know, much like sure. you you throw a chatter bait because it moves a lot of water, it gets the attention of a bass. You're, you're kind of employing the yeah. same logic to throwing a frog. Um, the fish can feel it and see it and hear it from a longer distance when it's pushing more of that water on top of the mat. You like a Kitech fat versus an easy shiner, right? It's going right. to move a little more. Same fast. principle. Right, right. Make a bigger wake on the surface. Or a rage tail versus a uh, full rage <clears throat> crawl versus a menace grub. And sometimes when you get the right consistency of duckweed, you even get this effect where it's like the frog is kind of like, if you get it weighted just perfect, it kind of like goes through the duckweed. Like it's like half on top, half under. And, it, sure. and it's weird, but they like that too. Do you keep different weights of frogs, like based on the thickness? Like, do you keep some, some buttermilk biscuit frogs, and then some? These are the crepey frogs, the lighter frogs, and then, you know, yeah. some mid range. Or are you just popping BBs throughout the day, kind of? Yeah, it? it's just a tinker as you go thing. Sure. I mean, like in that invitational, you know, I had whatever our two and a half, or I don't remember if it was three days of practice, whatever it was, plus the three days of the tournament. You know, by the final day of that tournament, you know, I, I had. I had been fishing some smallmouth and some junk fish in the first two days. And by the second day afternoon, it was like, I basically caught my whole bag on a frog. And then for the final day, you know, I spent a lot of time in the garage that night, really dialing it in. And that final day I had, you know, one heavy frog and one regular frog. So you tinker as you go and it comes with that time on the water in that specific week that you're working on yep. where you kind of figure it out for exactly what you're trying to do. Do you have like a number of BBs that you start with? Is it like three BBs or four BBs or the number I start with generally two pellets is and three BBs. zero. I mean, I, I'm a zero guy across the board typically. Unless unless until you have have that map situation where you need it to Yeah. You know, a lot of you times you need it to Yeah. Yep. Like And that's what I was finding in that invitational was the mats we had a pretty um sustained like south wind for two days in a row. 
and the area that I was fishing, the it pushed all those mats real tight against the the rice that I was fishing, and so um, that consistency of that duckweed was thick. It was real thick shit that they wanted to be in, and you had to have that heavier bait to ride lower. Attention, all bastronauts! This podcast is supported by. The Bass Galaxy's title sponsor, Waypoint Angler Supply, the Midwest's new landing pad for hardcore anglers just like you and me. If you're looking for the sneaky goods you can't find anywhere else, look no further. Waypoint Angler Supply has the largest offering of JDM tackle in the Midwest, and they are right here in Minnesota on Lake Minnetonka. This is truly a place every bass fisherman in Minnesota needs to visit because we finally have a tackle shop in the state that's as dreamy as the ones you find down south. And the staff at Waypoint Angler Supply understands the various needs of us anglers, which is why you'll find the selection there so enticing. Ross and the folks at Waypoint Angler Supply are passionate about carrying the right stuff, providing an authentic customer experience, and they listen to the anglers. And it doesn't end at JDM Baits. They stock all the top U.S. brands, as well as local Minnesota brands like the Selka Fishing and Customs, Arsenal Fishing, Bait Lab Custom Swim Baits, All Terrain Tackle, Bagley Northland, Outcast Tackle, and more. So stop into their store on Lake Minnetonka or visit their website, waypointanglersupply.com. That's waypointanglersupply.com. Use the code GALAXY0124 for the month of March to save 20% on your next order. Most tournament anglers and guides are not covered fully or properly. Most insurance policies don't cover exposure due to tournaments and guiding. Taking the chance of using the wrong insurance gives the insurance company an out when settling a claim. How will the insurance company know that you're fishing tournaments or guiding? Well, social media is their number one resource. And guess what? They use it. Lake Country Insurance offers one of the only products that can cover both tournament and guiding use in your vessel. Anglers don't seem to hesitate spending fifty to $100,000 for a boat. Why risk that large asset? All because you wanted to save a few extra shekels. Are you nuts? Call the folks at Lake Country Insurance today and make sure you have the proper coverage for your boat before the unexpected happens. Call 612 285 three one one three today or visit their website lcisagency.com that's lcisagency.com or to get their attention is if it you- the initial because so <clears throat> what i've learned about fishing duckweed is it's good to make a hole Sometimes. So, like, and this is old school duckweed trick from old school guys. It's you make the hole, reel it back, then throw it, and then they, they found the hole, they heard it, they yeah. eat it there. Is that weight of the frog, I guess my question is, is that more about the initial entry? Oh, they know something's there. Because a, a normal frog, like, you throw a piece of paper on this table, it's not going to make a noise. But then you throw this remote, it makes a noise. So they know you're there. So... Is it about that or more so the how much water it's moving throughout the cast or both probably it's, maybe a it's little bit. It's both and it's individual fish, differences for each individual fish. But what I found in this particular example that we're talking about with that invitational, I was making specific casts to very, very, very specific, like there'd be little crevices. Like you could read the read the rice, read the, the mat, and you would pretty much know like that little peninsula right there where the rice comes out and there's duckweed like there should be one there and of course i'm fishing for three bites so 90 percent of those little peninsulas and crevices that i'm looking at i don't get a bite but that's where the bites when they come are coming right there so you visualize a bite you know it's going to be there here's the deal with those fish they're so wary and so finicky and they're big they were big ones like every time i set the hook in the afternoon in that area it was three and a half pounds to four and a quarter pounds like big mm-hmm. ones for the river in July. And 
they're so smart that they would come up and swirl and like miss it or nip it. And if you missed them, that was it. Like they won't come back, come back tomorrow. And maybe you'll have another chance. Wow. So the weight of the frog, yes, it creates more presence. Yes, if you plop it in there. Now, this particular deal. Oh, I think I'm super getting where you're going now. With super this. shallow. I, I wasn't really it. trying to make a big plop. Just got it. Wasn't trying to make a big plop because if I made a big plop, I was going to spook him. So it was very, very technical. Like, I had to make an accurate throw, subtle entry. But when they did their little thing, I mean, some of them just creamed it, you know. But when you got that extra weight... And you know where I'm going. I do now. It's like, oh my god, this is a really actually, cool deal. Yeah. They actually got it. Yeah, dude. And what's crazy about that, and what, and it's the opposite of a tube jig for smallmouth, right? Like a tube jig, it's much easier for them to suck in an eighth ounce tube jig than it is a three eighth ounce tube jig, right. for example. But a frog, it's easier for them to suck in an eighth ounce. You know a a heavier one than a light one. Yeah. Based on buoyancy. Because the, yeah. the, like, you want to suck in a helium balloon, a regular balloon, or a water balloon, Cade. Right. Right. Well, I don't want to suck in any I of them. That sounds anyone, like a choking hazard. But. A lot of people don't think about that, though. That <laughs> right. is a, that's a, from a hookup ratio standpoint, if, if you only got one shot at them and when they suck that bait, they're sinking the bait. And mm-hmm. if the bait isn't resisting, trying to, float float away from them so to speak your chance at that Mm -hmm. fish is much better that's a nugget yep it is a nugget and the thing is though is like again got to know what you're doing you got to know what your cover is that you're targeting because when you take that same heavy ass frog that you're throwing in that thick stuff now you go to some sparse stuff now your frog's not getting the action you want so you got to go back to sinking too much yeah you, you it's just yeah it's dog shit in open water so you go back to that lighter standard frog for that kind of scenario. You so gotta do you have understand. a way to get the BBs out, or do you now Chain have frog. a now you have a now you no, have a these are fucked in open water frog box. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you can get them out if you really wanted to, but for the most part, I mean, I've got I've got that plain old frog box. My girlfriend's mom gave me a gift card to like tackle warehouse for Christmas last year, and I was so jacked because I knew exactly what I was gonna spend it on. It was that frog box, which is I mean, I can carry like fifty frogs. And I carry them all because, like, dude, you can never have enough frogs when the frog bite's on because you're going to lose some to pike. You know, they get beat up. Like, the hooks get fucked up um, and all that stuff. So it's nice to just have a whole bunch. And if I got one that I got weighted for a certain deal, I pretty much just leave it in the box. And someday I'm going to need it again, you know. So I don't usually try to get any BBs out. Most of the time it gets bit off before I ever get to that point. Right, right. (laughs) So, like... I've noticed this with the river. A horny toad is a super effective practice tool for me on the river when we're talking largemouth. Um, and when you say like that, those fish are getting more, like you have to fish more of an area. Like to me, my natural inkling would be to grab like a horny toad or, or a frog that I feel is more efficient at covering water and then fish that area more efficiently that way. But I feel like probably the deal is to be absolutely the opposite of that and be super painful i guess like how that is a struggle for me on that with frog fishing on when to do what Mm -hmm. and why and i guess swimming frog versus like a not moving frog in that area that's vast like what lacrosse has evolved into to me that that becomes a tougher yeah debate and it really depends on the conditions too. Like those those days that you're talking about, where you can cover water and uh, throw a moving frog like that in sparse cover and just really burn around. It's typically, when you got you know a frontal situation, maybe some some rain, some clouds. Probably more springtime too. Now that I oh, think yeah. about it, like I I fish the spring like the river in the spring more often than any yeah. other time of the year. So probably like the majority of my mind is thinking yeah. about the spring. It's a little more sparse then. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you got cloudy conditions, sparse cover, moving baits. If you got sunny conditions, not a lot of wind, that's when you're really, you know, you put your raptors down, really picking things apart and going super slow, trying not to make a lot of noise in the boat. And, 
yeah, you got to vibe out what the fish are doing. Like sometimes you can get by with reeling that frog and they'll crush it. And they, they do like, like, you know, you got to vary your cadence, just like any other bait, whether it's a jerk bait, you got to figure out the day. Every day is different. Some days they want it reeled and then stopped and reeled and stopped. Some days you'll be reeling your frog back to the boat and one will just crush it right at the boat. Burning. Like followed it like hot, came out of there a torpedo and crushed it. And then, you know, that's like a light bulb going off. But, you know, when things are tough and there's a lot of pressure on the water with boats and tournaments going on, typically it's a real slow twitch, 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 twitch kind of deal. Unless you find something that's been really unmolested for a long time. Like that's kind of what you're going to be facing. You got to fish it slower versus faster is what you're saying. More often than not. Yeah. But, Without leaving it sit. Do you guys like, because up, up in the lakes of Minnesota, you know, yeah. we dead stick the old jig worms. Oh, yeah, and, and, we dead you know, stick them. We em. do that. When they get the old pressure, you know, mm-hmm. we just open the bail, bud. <laughs> just open the bail. <laughs> is that what you guys do with the frogs? You just free spool the old frog on the mat, bud? <laughs> Wait for him to bite. Is that a thing? I would, I would say I'm not a free spooling guy because you got to be ready for that hook set. I'm not a. I don't wait when, like, to me, it's all senses are in, are active. Well, you don't wait because you already added your weight. Yeah, good one. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Puns. Huh. So, to me, I'm. It's a visual deal. I can tell when that fish has got it. It's also a sound deal. I found like if I'm wearing headphones, I'd miss more frog fish. It's weird. But I can see that. If actually. all my senses are coordinating with my frog bite, I'm not waiting on that fish like whatsoever, and. So it's just, you know, slurps it, jag it, whatever. So I'm not free spooling because I'm always wanting to be ready for that bite. But, but yes, there are times where, like I said, you're not disengaging the reel, but you are just literally twitching it and letting it sit sometimes for three, five seconds. And, right. you know, a five second pause on a frog, it, it feels like a pretty long time to me. Well, the bail open is more of a figure of speech. I okay, guess. okay. I was going for the more literal version and I was like, damn, Hook dude. <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, that's definitely definitely a thing to keep in mind is just a slow down, you know. It's becoming more like that's... you hear that in Florida, slow down everything. If you it think you're going everywhere. slow enough, you go slower. That's how it is with frog fishing now, you know. You get maybe maybe, maybe you, I you, can do that. Whole if you fish, fish 50 thing. days in the summer, you're going to probably get two or three of them that remind you of the old days where it's just like holy shit. They're blasting a frog that's today. Happening. And there, there will be little periods, little windows that open up where maybe we'll be like that for a couple of weeks and then it's done. And a lot of times that relates to fluctuations in water that move fish. And when they get somewhere new, they're, they're chomping. You sure. know what I mean? Sure. But sure. if the water's stable, there's been tournaments, there's been a lot of recreational fishermen and things haven't changed much in a while, be ready for that frog bite to be grimy, tough, still, still needs to be on the back of your mind, like it's still probably going to produce some high finishing tournament bags, but it's going to be tough. So that leads me to a few questions. Like, so I want to touch on this real quick and then I want to get into another one. But so those retread black river fish, for example, or from your experience, retread fish touching on the retread fish aspect, because there seems to be a factor to that on any major tournament body of water. From your experience, how long do those fish, you know, stay in a location, those retread fish, before they, you know, leave or don't play anymore? Well, I think there's fish in the Black River that are so retreaded that they're like just, they they just gave up trying to leave and they just took up residence. And so there's, Black River has got them. Like there's a ton of fish. There's big ones. They're smart. But when they, they bite. got their birth certificates printed at <laughs> yeah. Ellis, Ellis Island. They're yeah. official now. Black River bass. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, when they're, when they're biting, you can, you can do some things in there, you know? Yeah. And, and there's been, especially when the pro tournaments come here, there's always guys that finish really well, staying pretty much exclusively in there. So I'm not going to knock it, but it's not, to me, it's not river bass fishing. Like that's not what you come to lacrosse to do is go beat on the, Rip rap and <coughs> docks and <coughs> bridge pilings. Like, if you come here for a destination vacation, that just just make sure you leave there because you need to experience true Mississippi River bass fishing. That's not it. Right. right. If you're in a tournament and you can't find anything else, then know that you can always catch bass there. Yes, but 
How many of those fish, okay, like how many of those fish stay versus leave? Because okay. obviously you mentioned that some were now, yeah. you know, waving a new Black I River think, flag. I think probably, I mean, it depends on where they were caught, too. You obviously, know, right? I would say probably 75% of them probably leave and, and start at least trying to get back to where they came from. How long does that take, do you think? A week? I think at least probably to, like to fully get back. Well, it depends on where they came process. from. But like say they came from the south end of Pool 8. Probably takes them a week or two to get down there. But, I mean, I've seen them. I've caught groups of release fish that I know were released somewhat close to the Black River. And I've caught them, you know, at least a couple of miles downstream, like, pretty pretty quick after the event. So, I know they're moving, you know. Well, but. I've seen how quick they move up to, like, spawn and stuff. So, that's why I was going to ask you is, like, you know, I've seen how fast they can be, oh, not spawning, oh, spawning, oh, post spawn yeah <laughs> like within one day if you had a weird enough weather day on the river you could go from pre-spawn to like you know foreplay <laughs> to like post spawn in the yeah. same day yeah that's so very like true. with them retreads and then those fish seem to be migratory in the sense of like running way up a backwater and then running all the way down and that or you know floating all the way down or however they want to do it back to the channel yeah that's kind of where my question came about is when we fuck with them how yeah. fast do they move after that <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's it just definitely depends on conditions too like uh, if the water's rising and stuff when you let those fish go like that makes them do some funky things too like you know thinking back to the elite series um trying to think of which one that was who won it i think it was the one that ishman Rowe won in lacrosse i know oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2018 randall tharp like the final day or it was either the third or final day i think it was the third day he caught like 17 pounds like literally on the other side of the off limits flag right by the takeoff ramp like clearly release fish like just blistered them and then the final day he caught like another 13 or 15 pounds and like he finished he might have finished second he, he finished really really well having those his two best days were retread fish right there but the water was rising and those fish like i don't know if they got weird because they didn't want to try to go anywhere crazy with it coming up like that they sensed that i think so they just kind of sucked tight to the bank and got on hard cover and they were like easy pickings low hanging fruit and so that kind of stuff can happen but i think especially when the water's low like it often is in the summertime and it's hot and, and whatnot those fish like are um they're eager to get into some current and cooler water. The Black River gets warm. You know, it's tannic. It's more tannic colored water, so it heats up. It's always a few degrees warmer than the, the Big River. And, you know, there's definitely more oxygen, I feel, in the heavier current flow. So sure. I think just depending on the conditions will warrant whether those fish are more likely to stay or leave quicker. But either way, a river bass wants to be in the river. And most of them, I think, do get back there. It's just that maybe 25% that end up sticking around and becoming local to the black. Yep. And, yeah, over the years, I feel like it, that little 25% or whatever it is has really supplemented that area, and there's always fish, I mean, in the black. but Sure. Well, that kind of leads me to my next question because I love the way you think about things. And to me, there's something I've noticed and something I've picked up on with rivers, and it's uh, – well, it's, it's not that unobvious. It's water fluctuation, right? Yeah. And it's kind of a two-part question, but I want to know, I want to dig into a little bit how you look at water fluctuation. But I guess to start that off, I think I want to know what you think makes a great river angler versus maybe just a good one. What's the difference? I think I can hit this. Uh, it's Oh, I know you can because yeah. you're a great one. Well, I try to be. I aspire to be for sure, but... The biggest thing about being a consistent river fisherman is being able to throw everything you have out the window at a moment's notice. I mean, and I'm not talking about just like everything you had in practice for this week. I'm talking about every spot you own from your whole lifetime, you know, like forget it. You caught them there four years ago. They're not coming back. They're gone. The spot is gone. You know what I mean? Yep. And you see, and I've, I've done it. I mean, I still do it all the time. Like, I go back and check stuff just to see, like, maybe the magic is back. It doesn't ever come back. You got a little sand corner with some weeds and, you know, everything's perfect one year and you absolutely smash them and you want to turn them in off of it. 
you go back to next year, it's it's wrecked most of the time, you know. The very few places, I mean, certain certain physical objects in the river don't change, right? You got wing dams and you know, certain hard cover aspects that are always there. That stuff doesn't change, but if you're talking about sand and cut banks and, you know, backwater type stuff where current is fluctuating constantly, vegetation, I mean, none of that stuff stays the same for more than a year or two. And so the way to be good is to know that while you have done things in the past off of certain areas, just know that the areas you're going to do well on in the future don't even exist yet. And they're coming. So you're always looking for what's developing. Like I, I'll take rides around and I see stuff that you're like, oh, I think, you know, I see a little seam right there that I've never noticed before. Like, looks like there's a sandbar. You go over there and you side image and you're like, there's a sandbar. It's it's a I little bit. I, I think I'm reading the, okay, so y- you need an in with Corps of Engineers <laughs> and you need to understand the blueprint of how things are, are about to shake out here the next five years on how they're going to change that pinball machine of a river channel you got. No? Not so much. I don't, a I mean. Less, okay. I'm yep. talking about natural elements. I'm not talking about, oh, they're going to build a <laughs> rock water, island. low water. Yeah, you're talking. Yeah, that. I got you. But not even that. I mean, it's just a little less. Monster, regardless, but cool. regardless of what the rivers, if the rivers high or low, it doesn't really matter. Just know that the river is always cutting a ditch, and it's cutting new ones every day. And sometimes it does the opposite of what you think it's going to do. Um, you know, like there's been some. There's a couple of places I can think of off the top of my head, in some of those sloughs where I grew up in Goose Island, that used to be so shallow you could barely get through them. And then we have a couple of low water years and you think there's no way I'm going to ever get through that now. But all of a sudden it's five foot deep. Go right through. No problem. Never hit bottom. How do you anticipate things? Sorry. Well, my, my theory with some of that is, you know, when the water's low, it's channeling it into the existing pathways, right? So even though there's less water in the whole system, that area is receiving more of the water that's coming through there. So it, even though the water might be low, it can cut certain areas deeper. Uh-huh. It's going to dig it down deeper because sure. when the water's high, it spreads out. So all that water, all that sediment comes out in a fan shape. But I'm when it's channelized up. because the water's in its banks like it's supposed to be, yep. it starts cutting down rather than out. So some of those secondary channels that are pretty maybe blown out in the spring or when the water's high, but when the water's low them secondary channels with maybe a few deeper cuts in them, right? Start to have a few more areas open up maybe is what you're saying and certain, things like that? Certain stuff has done that, yes. But then huh. on the flip side, I've seen other places that used to be deep fill in to where you get stuck. So it goes both ways. A lot of it just has to do with, you know, what's going on there. Like if there's an outside bend, inside bend, you know, inside bends is where that's going to lay all the sediment. So eventually that inside bend is going to get wider or it's going to get bigger and it's going to push the water further and further outside Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and eventually it's got nowhere to go but break through that bank and it's going to carve a new channel absolutely and and once it makes that final break and pushes through and creates a totally new channel now all that flow is being redirected somewhere else and it's like changes everything in the area because now flow is getting cut off that used to come through over here it's going over here, so this fills in, this gets silty. It's Everything's just always changing. Yeah. And, I mean, I'm sure if you were just a genius, you could see that coming and know how that's going to happen. But all you can really do is just be out there as much as you can, drive around, see keep it. your eyes on it, and watch it over the years. And, you know, Google Earth helps. You look at historic images, and you start to see trends of, okay, this is starting to fill in. This is starting to open up, and, you know, you can predict a little bit, but you just got to go out there and keep looking. But just knowing that there's new shit being built all the time, and there's going to be new clam beds that form in the next 10 years that never existed where they do because the flow changed, and now they can use this area. Like, just stuff like that. I mean, clam... clam so, yeah, this shell bed thing, we got to, you know, we, we got to have some caviar on that quick. Like, <laughs> okay, okay. What's uh, the shell bed thing, it's... it's uh, to me, it's a special kind of thing that's hard to find. They're kind of, for people who aren't experienced with fishing shell, I think they that it's extremely difficult thing to find and fish. Yeah. And know you're fishing it. 
For sure. I mean, a lot of times, sometimes sand can confuse you. And like, cause the rip was telling me that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll feel the whoop de doos. Yeah, you so. feel the ripples in the sand, and you'll feel it. A lot of times, that's going to register in your brain as a hard bottom because you feel dunk, 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 dunk. But really, it's just your bait flowing with the current, and it's bouncing over those little micro waves in the sand, and it feels like hard bottom. That doesn't mean it's not good. The sand can be really good, but but you know, there's subtle differences. You're going to know when it's actual clam versus just that whoop de doo that you're talking about. Um, it feels a little harder, you know, yeah, you can definitely tell when it's a real hard clam bottom. But then the other thing is when you got an active clam bed with live clams on it, you know, that's what you really want. I mean, yes, fish will use the leftover dead, you know, just the shells that are laying around. There's a lot of that out there and, and it can be good. Any, any little bit of hard bottom is better than nothing typically because you're in a river. There's a lot of muck. There's a lot of stuff. So anywhere where there's a clean, hard bottom is always going to be a high percentage zone. But if you got a thick mass of live clams, that's money and that's special. And it's it's not easy to find, as you said. Um, but you're going to get signs of it. A lot of times you'll end up hooking some, yeah, you know, sure, sure. like you're dragging a Carolina rig. And if you're fishing a Carolina rig the way it's intended, you're fishing slow enough that a clam can grab that weight when it comes by. Sure, sure. And then you end up, oh, shit, I got a clam. <coughs> And then you got to sit there and pry it off there. And you're like, Jesus Christ, that is the ugliest looking thing I've ever seen. Right. But I thank God that you exist. Is there any predictability to where they're sitting in the current? From my experience, more on the eddy side, but I feel like I don't know. That's where I've found the couple that I've found is on the eddies, in the in the eddies. I seem to flat. find I seem to find that they like to be in the current. like On the upside? Yeah, upside. Well, not necessarily upside. It's just like in a it's place hitting? where there's always a guaranteed current. Like, yes. Like so, if you're in an area that agree. yeah, if you're in an area that is when the water's up, there's current. But then when the water shuts off, the current dies. Like that's not necessarily high percentage for clams because they want to have that steady, consistent current. I'm not necessarily saying they're in the hardest flow, but they need to have a constant flow coming across them. That's just. I think it's just the way they feed and the way they live and also the substrate of the bottom they want to be on. They want to be on a, a cleaner bottom, sand bottom usually. Sure. And so that's where the, that's where those elements kind of collide is in that flow. So Is there too heavy a flow where claims are like, when I open my mouth, I lo- lose my top, my top <laughs> I, jaw? I don't think there really is. I mean, I've seen them in some really strong, strong current. I, I sure. do think they'll tolerate heavy, heavy current. Like as heavy as we were fishing today? Yeah, for sure. How heavy do you think that was today? Four. I mean, it was at least a three and a half mile an yeah. hour current, but probably four. Yeah, it was reminding me of early May Mississippi fishing. Yeah, I mean, like it's, Main River. it was stiff, but yeah. I okay. mean, so they have no issue with three or four mile an hour. Current, right. The, the biggest thing is the fish do. So you got to find the clam bed that's on the right flow for what the fish want too. So have you noticed a spe- like a certain current that the fish like to be in? Because obviously. You can catch them in four mile an hour current, but you're probably not catching them all in the four mile an hour. You're probably catching them where the four mile an hour deflects yeah. into exactly. nothingness, and then maybe a two mile an hour yeah. swirl or a mile and a half hour. There's swirl. definitely a sweet spot, and it also depends on the season. You know, def- my typical rule of thumb is, you know, warmer water bass like heavier current. So, sure. so that's something to keep in mind. But that makes sense. Typically, in general, it's always what I would consider. And what Jacob Wheeler referred to very intelligently in one of his videos when he was in lacrosse, he referred to it as a meandering current. And I really like that terminology that he came up with. It's it's like a medium current. It's not too fast, not too slow. It's like a nice, you know, you're drinking a beer, going down in a kayak, just enjoying the day. Yep. That's kind of the current you want to be in. And that's not to say that... Does that change from largemouth to smallmouth? Because... I it, feel like it might a it, little bit. It does, but in the summertime, it's really kind of both. The largemouth sure. do really like a current, too. And, and well, the, yeah, it's even, just it seems like, I know they both like a current, but do a largemouth like a meandering and do a smallmouth like a, like a more of an aggressive change from less meandering yeah, that's, to... Yeah, that's valid. Yes, I will validate I, that I don't point. know. I'm asking. No, it, it, I guess what I would say is a largemouth likes a meandering current <laughs> alongside cover that they're using whether it's a, a mat a lay down cut bank sure 
whereas the smallmouth likes a hard current meeting a meandering current. That makes okay. That makes sense. And so there's yeah. usually a structural element there, whether it's a wing dam, a piece of wood, a point, or sandbar, whatever. But it's always kind of that intersection of two currents. Yeah. But they're they're positioned in the meandering current. They don't just sit in like crazy heavy current, you right. know, for fun. Right. They still, even though they can tolerate that crazy heavy current. Hey guys, Gaff with Waypoint English Supply here. Just wanted to highlight the fact that we have the big bass resource right here. Obviously, everybody in Minnesota knows about Kytex and the littler swim baits like these bait labs here, but we're here to have the big baits here in the store. We got Huddleston's, we've got the dangerous swim baits, the jointed claw glide baits, and the bull shooter glide baits, but it's not only the baits. We've got big rods, big reels, big line, and all that good stuff for you guys to go ahead and chase your biggest fish of your life. So swing on into Waypoint English Supply and get hooked up with the biggest tackle around. All right. They migrate through it, but they aren't sitting there stationary for any reason. You know, sure. they'll come out sure. into it to feed and then they go back into their meandering current that they like to rest in. Sure. But then as you, that's, you know, that's more of like a summertime deal with the current. As you progress into like wintering, then it becomes a, a little bit different. You know, it's, it's really a s real slow, slow current. Like you go from meandering down to like the next step where it's like a breath of current. Like there's always flow, it's, but it's like a seeping current. Like they can't even tolerate the meandering anymore because it, it, they're just, they need to be completely resting. Is this postponed or like later? This is, this is wintering is what oh, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah, jumping yeah. the gun. That, nope, you're freaking, good. There's no rules in the galaxy. <laughs> Verbal diarrhea. So do you have like, so water level to me is a big thing. Do you have an, I have an app for water level. Mm -hmm. Do you have a specific app you use? I, was gonna, I lost my phone. I should probably use an app, but I just go to the website most often. Website. There's a, if you search Mississippi River. Website. At lacrosse stage. Mississippi on Google, River at lacrosse stage. On Google, you're going to get the lacrosse stage we'll pull up the it'll this time of year it only gives you the current stage because they don't do forecasting in the winter but in the you know boating season of the year it will give you the current stage it'll give you like three days of history yep. behind that and then it's going to show you a forecasted graph of what it's going to do and generally they always tend to over predict you know it doesn't on a rise. as much as you think Usually, it just depends, you know, but typically, like, we'll get a pretty big thunderstorm boomer up in Minneapolis or whatever, and then, you know, as soon as the thunderstorm is over, all of a sudden we got this new projection, river's going to go up two feet. Usually, by the time it actually happens, you can pretty much subtract it. You know, you can take off at least, like, a foot, you know, a lot of times. It's not usually as drastic as it initially, the initial forecast will come out to be. But we do occasionally, sometimes it goes the other way, but usually it's pretty good. Like, you can usually plan on it being a little bit less aggressive than what it says. Dude, I have four questions for you right now. Rapid okay. fire. Somewhat. Okay. First scenario, springtime. Water's projected to rise a bunch. Tournament's tomorrow. What adjustment are you making, typically? What's the weather doing? What's well, the, water the water's doing? rising. What is, it's springtime, and the water's rising the direction the fish go two directions colder or warmer right typically okay and then rising or falling cold and warm rising or falling to an extent right kind of yeah so in the springtime but it's when you some get aspects to that there is there is and i'm not trying to get there there's nuance to any answer right right but like generally speaking in the springtime when you have rising water To me, I'm making adjustments like the open stuff mm -hmm. that shallow plays less. Yes. For example, they go to a hard and, line, and the stuff that has more of a steeper a, a wall next to it. Yeah. So that would be my example of like the adjustment I would make rising water in the spring. Yeah, so you're then, right. That's okay, accurate. So then, rising water in the or no, falling water in the spring. Falling water in the spring, typically they're just going to recede to the outside of wherever they're currently at. So like, 
Let's they say, only need four inches to spawn, so it probably depends, right? Right. Let's let's say falling water, no cold front. Calling wa- falling water, no cold front. If they're on the precipice of spawning, they're probably gonna not. They're probably gonna still pull back. Sure. They get to that first current seam outside the spawning area. That's that's your high percentage spot. Will they try to like make out like two feet deeper, mm. or they're like. Usually they don't. This is done. This Tammy. This is the. They'll come back. Out. They they go in and out of those spawning areas so many times. Yeah. Like I've even seen like the big, the real big females that are the prime breeders. They're they'll, Mormons. They'll spawn more than once. More ma- and, and on Mormons, different on different with ways. More than one husband. Yeah, for yeah. sure. But also they'll they'll make sure they spawn a little bit on the early wave and they'll spawn again sometimes later on. In the sp- like might be three weeks later, but they just recede out to the current and stage, and then they pull back in. They wait for conditions to be just right. So if the water's falling, you know it might you might have a full moon, you might have sixty three degree water temperature, sunny, beautiful. It only got down to fifty five last night. I had bed fish here yesterday. Now they're all empty beds. I don't understand. Well, even though everything's perfect, if that water's falling that can make a lot of fish get a little nervous and they'll back out. It just depends on the area though, too. Like kind of like rising in cold front, I think does the same thing. Like if you have rising with a cold, like cold rain, yeah, cold, like 40, like you had 60 to 70 degrees, sunny days. And then you have 45 degree rain. That's cold. So the water rises, but then fish all of a sudden, they don't go with it because the, yeah, because the cold. But here's we another won a tournament anticipating that one time. That's badass. It on the cool. river? Yeah, that, that one. Uh, that one, yeah. Nice. It's badass. We caught a post spawn largemouth with a bloody tail at, or not a bloody tail, but post spawn at like noon that day. And that's when we knew. Because like two days before that went down, them largies were like, they would have beat us. Mm-hmm. Two days prior, we had got. Our ass is stomped by a big bag of largies. I'd almost guarantee it. That's crazy. So. Well, what's funny, what you just mentioned, I know you've already discussed this kind of scenario with Wyatt because him and I fished that tournament last spring, caught a big bag. Yeah. The spot that we caught him off of, I would practiced and caught nothing but a giant walleye, and he had found fish spawning up in the bay around the corner from there um, like two days before the tournament. It's pool seven. No, this was okay. up on one of the upper pools. Um, so it's an eerie start of a story is all. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Because I had a spot in seven that I caught oh. two big walleyes on in practice, but I just had a good feeling about it. It was super sneaky. It was perfect. A little sandy, just a little sneaky sand spot. We pulled up their tournament day, caught our biggest smallmouth of the day. There, no walleyes. So <laughs> that's yeah, legit. Anyway, yeah. No, but so low key. This situation where we ended up blasting him on the tournament day, and we went up and caught like 13 pounds of largemouth right away off of the spawning stuff. But you could tell it wasn't right, and yeah. they were just bucks. Yeah. Um, that particular scenario was we had not necessarily a big cold front, but it was cool. It wasn't ideal conditions to push fish up but also the water was falling rapidly so all those fish the big females came off the bed and they went back to the current flow and they all like i think all those fish had at least some bit of a bloody tail but they had full bellies yet like they they were up there dicking around getting ready yep and they just said no it's falling too fast for me boys almost got tammy's bra off and then (laughs) oh yeah yeah Let's oh, go out. Let's I go heard a this. door. Mom and dad walked in. <laughs> yeah. Shit. Yeah, exactly. So it can go all different ways. And the other thing I always, this is, you know, you talked about dropping some snacks and maybe not dropping the kitchen sink, but this is the kitchen sink and I'm willing to drop it right here. Dude, here it hey. comes. Big thing in the spring, more than any other time of year, what you have to consider is the temperature on the water or the water temperature on the river like varies so drastically. Like, I've seen it before. Certain backwaters will have 60-degree water, and some places actually still have ice. Right. Like, in that March period when the ice is coming off, places that lose the ice first and have that dark bottom and green water, like, that shit gets warm, like, so fast. Kind of like wearing a black T-shirt in the summer, right, versus a white one. But you know what else happens? We get those stupid 
April snowstorms that seem to plague us lately. Oh, yeah. So what do you think happens to that same spot that got warm so fast? It gets cold so fast. Yeah. So, But what do you think happens to the main channel and the high flow? Right areas? outside of there. But I'm saying, what do you, what does the water temperature do in those areas? Not doesn't fluctuate as much as that area exactly. you just told me. Correct. So what it's happens, stable, what, so to speak? So what happens is you go from having all the warmest water is way in the backs of stuff. Now all of a sudden, all the warmest water is way in the fronts of stuff in the heaviest current. So even though it makes no sense, like you think it's springtime, the fish are making a move towards the back. It's not like a big southern reservoir where the fish make a move to the backs of the creeks and then they stage back there and then eventually spawn back there. Our fish are way more like pick up stakes and move tomorrow because this is what we got to do. Like, okay, Tammy, we'll go to Burger King now. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's like you can go from having 60 degree water in the spawning bay. Like they're, and but they're, they're usually pretty smart and they kind of know that it's not right yet. They know it's too early, length of day, all that shit. Well, they feel the environment, like we are, we are so far removed from the environment that they're immersed in. Right. They have, like, they know what's happening sense. before we do. Yeah. But yeah, they, they know like that the natives, man. when that cold front hits that shallow stuff, they know that that current's got the warm water. So now all of a sudden, you know, last week the main channel was 51 and the backwaters were 65. They don't want to be in 51 when they can be in 65. Yeah. Now cold front hits shallow backwaters like 43 and the main channel is 48 or 49 right. all of a sudden that looks a lot better well they don't they and don't. that's what i look for that's how you win a tournament is when you recognize that and you revert to that now you got fish that just got to a place that haven't been on a place and it's like we talked about with the frog bite when new fish come to a spot it's over i mean when you got the right school you know the fish you know those fish you know what kind of fish calibers mm -hmm. there and they show up on the day of the tournament. You didn't practice it, but you intuitively knew that they had to get out of here and this is where they've got to go. Yeah. That's that's when all the stars kind of align and that's something that I always try to try to think about and look for when you have those cold fronts. That's my first BFL that I ever won. That's what happened. Um like 3 days before the tournament, I saw insane largemouth fishing, shallow grass flat, chatterbait, 60 degree water. It was insane. I caught a 17-inch fish that weighed 4 pounds. Um, and then 30 degrees the day before the tournament, cold as shit. Um, I caught smallmouth outside of a spawning bay that it was like, I caught a three pounder on my first cast of the day and I caught like 30 keepers and a six pounder, biggest six, four biggest smallmouth I've ever caught. And it was all because they had moved into a spawning bay and then the cold flushed them out and they, they had nowhere to go, but right to me, you know, and that, that's like the dream scenario. I mean, there was 13 pounds on it the day before the tournament, and there was 22 on it the day of the tournament. All those females said, we'll be back when it warms up. And that, to me, is what's so beautiful about the river, is it, there, it is a little <coughs> bit... It, there's a hackability to that, where it's, it almost sucks to talk about, but that, that is amazing information, and I think that is what makes a great river angler versus a good one, is anticipating change. Yeah. That to me is everything when it comes to a great river angler versus a good one is being able to read current and anticipate where the fish are going to be and because it's going to change and they're going to be somewhere else most likely. Right? 100%. Okay, so summertime river fishing, right? Water's rising versus falling. Like what are your adjustments there? Because that's, I would say, where I have a little bit less experience and I would say it's also a little bit more challenging or just like a lake, a little bit less predictable because you don't have that spawning factor. You don't have that, you know, backwater highway this way, that way factor. Once they get out to that channel, mm -hmm. to me, it becomes more about food. Yeah. Right. So then how do you figure out where the bait's at? Like, cause there always seems to be a magic you know, stretch the river. So how do you find bait in the river? And then what does rising and falling water do to, you know, your adjustments? And and again, that, that goes back to in the summertime where paying attention to current flow is so big. So now, you know, what I generally the smallmouth, what the smallmouth will do is in a low water situation, a large group of fish are concentrated on the main channel where they have the 
current flow that they want. Mm -hmm. Heavy current meeting meandering current, as we touched on before. Now, the whole main channel is heavy current. There's not as many current breaks. It's not suitable. A lot of times there's... We're really, talking rising? Yes, yeah. on the rising water. Um, a lot of times there's really dirty water associated with that, too, on the main river. Yeah, you got So now, stuff. all of a sudden, to find that intersection of the heavy current and meandering current, they're still looking for that, but you have to go into the backwaters to find it. So that's where you see a push of smallmouth come into backwaters. Sure. Now you start catching them more on sand and... You know, they'll they'll use the cut banks a little bit to migrate on. Those fish you can't rely on really at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're just traveling. So if you catch a four pound smallmouth flipping a jig on a on the overhanging bank, I wouldn't wouldn't bet the farm on that. Hoochie gypsies, got it. But yeah, those fish are migrating back into the backwaters to get back in that stable, meandering current. And that's because that's where the food source is going too. I mean just shad, that, shad or whatever. Yeah, shad. Um, you know, shad aren't as big of a factor in early summer but they come into play more in like mid to late july and then all the way till ice up but sure. early summer it's more about small minnows pin minnows all the fry from you know perch walleyes pike all the fish that spawned early in march and stuff like that red horse we caught one today <laughs> and don't talk too in much in the mouth they do definitely Sorry. was that they, a they, little nah, it's, it's not that big of a deal i've never really there was one instance where it was in the Bassmaster open fishing was tough there was about an eight-inch red horse came up on the surface flailing about, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? All of a sudden, I see like a three-and-a-half-pound smallmouth just chasing it every move, like just following it like crazy, trying to eat it. Everybody's going to be painting their freaking yeah, crankbaits. Well, the tail's red after this game. <laughs> they might, Jeez. and that might work. But, I don't know. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I, I can't say it's like some big correlation. I think it's just a – the fact of the matter is the fish is an opportunist, uh, opportunist and they will chase what they can – get their hands on especially when there's a scarcity mm -hmm. of other food you know um but yeah it's in the in the summer it's more pin minnows fry um emerald shiners are a big thing all kind there's so many different species of like shiners and little suckers and yeah all that kind of shit is all a factor and then actually bluegills like smallmouth eat a lot of bluegills like really? more than people think i actually think you're right little ones especially little ones especially but i mean they'll choke on a big one too if they can get on it you know so i mean just all the food in a high water situation is in the backwaters so that's where they're migrating towards sure now as it falls we're, we're just we'll get back to the largemouth for now we're going to start on smallmouth and then we'll talk about largemouth on the fall and in the rise so as it falls then they just kind of suck back out and what's crazy to me but really awesome too because, again, going back to being able to anticipate things, as soon as that river starts to drop, like, honestly, even before it starts to drop, like, as soon as it stops rising, like, you'll see that trigger where they start to go the other way with it. Like, now, the flow, you watch that flow, like, that same website we talked about, Google Lacrosse Stage, Mississippi River at Lacrosse Stage, you can also find data for the flow. And you'll see that flow start to drop. The water might even still be rising, at this point but the flow is starting to to slide lower and as that flow drops that triggers those fish if they're up shallow somewhere they know it's changing and going the other way and they already will start to trigger to move out so i'll be on the front end of that where hey they're back they're getting back in this heavy shit migrating back towards like the main channel and heavy duty current like already even though the water hasn't even stabilized fully yet just that trigger of the flow drop and they know it's about to drop and they know it's time to start getting out so they don't get stuck flow somewhere. less current or yeah, more? Less, like the flow's dropping, less current. So they it, start going back towards yeah. the heavier current. Because you have rising and falling, but you also have how much that dam is pulling. Yeah, cubic right? feet per second, baby. So you had, so I was talking about one scale, one axis, right? But there's also, to your point, Mm -hmm. another so you could have rising water and rising current speed or rising water and falling current speed mm -hmm. which now this is where math class would get hard for me as well like now we're now there's a lot of rate there's a lot of things to consider, think of it like this right? think of those That's crazy think of those rulers that they sell at the store that give you a, oh yeah I've shows seen a ruler. you a, show, well you know a fish ruler yeah <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, one inch, two inch, three inch, all you know, 14 inch bass, and then it shows below 
you know, 1.5 pounds. And then it goes to 15 inch bass, two pounds. And it has yeah. a scale where it's giving you a recommendation of this is what that fish weighs. Sure. Well, obviously we know that that's a, it's that's like a counting software. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a guesstimation that it might weigh that, but some fish are super skinny and some fish are super fat. The same thing is with that website that shows you the data for the, the stage height. It's going to say, okay, let's say it's 5.3. At 5.3, the flow should be X. It's going to give you an estimated flow. But then additionally, you can open up the tabular data, which will show you the actual flow. And a lot of times, the flow can vary drastically from what could be expected at that stage. So like last Does year... That, is that like when you have like, oh, they're going to do this, and then they don't, and you look back? Is that like the... Ah, oh, fuck the flow. There's, like, there's been a lot of times. So oh, man. See, this is cool. The flow cool. is something I used to always just ignore because it was just too overwhelming for me. It's like, God, I, I already have to keep track of all this other shit. Like, and I don't need to learn calculus. But like, like, the last three years, I'd say, I've started to really pay attention to it more and just taking mental notes of, especially on the days when I, like, really caught them, what happened then or the days that really sucked. Right. You know, you're taking into account what was the barometric pressure doing, what was the flow doing, what was the weather, what what are the fish just doing in general right now, seasonal pattern wise. Right. You know, and try to put it all together, like what's triggering them to move towards their winter hole because the water temperature hasn't changed, but all of a sudden all the fish are migrating now. You know, things like that. You're looking for that. But what I've noticed, like last summer, the the river stage was in general really low, like pretty much the entire summer there was a couple little spikes but it never got high like there'd be times where the stage is flat across the board but then we'd have like a rogue thunderstorm come through and get like a half an inch of rain and the next day the flow would spike like 10 15 thousand cubic feet per second and the fish would fucking bite and then two days later it would be back to nothing flat line and you know it was back to kind of okay it's kind of grimy and that happened to me pre-fishing for the Prairie du Chien BFL three nights after work. Cause I work in the summertime. I work day shift. Yep. So I'm work, I'm going fishing in the afternoons, which already in the summer afternoon bite, like towards evening is great comparatively, you know, to the morning. Yeah, so it sure. gives you a little bit of a false sense sometimes anyway, but also the flow was really ripping like Thursday or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I caught the hell out of them all three nights. Like, I was sticking quite a few fish, like, more than you should be in a, in a practice for a tournament. But they were just biting so good that I wasn't even, I didn't even care. I was just having fun. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I fuck this tournament. Like, I'm going to blister them in this tournament so I can afford to stick all these two and a half pounders that aren't going to matter. Until you catch, yeah. But then what I, happened, I hear you there. the day of the tournament, for some reason, when I got up that morning, I didn't check what the flow did. And... I, I don't know if it would have mattered anyway, because honestly, after have, having a good practice, you're probably still going to go and fish the same stupid uh, shit. Good practice is just wrecking yeah. sometimes. So I fished all that shit and didn't catch shit. I ended up having an okay tournament. I got like the last check because I, I ended up switching to smallmouth and that kind of salvaged my day. Mm -hmm. But then I get back online and I'm like, God, what happened to all these largemouth that were just choking a white swim jig? Like, what the hell? Can't even get a bite like and any of that stuff. The flow would drop drastically, like 15,000 cubic feet per second overnight. I'm starting to put the picture together a little bit, but I'm sure there's always variables. So, like, you have rising and falling water, right? Mm -hmm. That's your positioning factor. Rising yeah. and falling is positioning. Flow is almost attitude and activity. It and can I, be, yeah, like, for sure. So, like, you have... But it also can move, it can move them, though, too. Positioning, and you have... I could see that for sure, but but will it move them as far? Yeah, probably not. Right, but they just they just depends. position different. Flow will affect how they position, just like rising and falling. Yeah, but it's within that maybe little spot. Oh, that's such a the one see, thing. I'm that's just so glad you brought it up because your average Joe is like this is like the core essence meat and potatoes of, yeah. like i love this shit and your average bass fisherman might be like no i just want to know what frog to throw like no dude this is what like yeah. this is interesting and a lot of it is you can put it in layman's terms like you're out there on the water and and you do see a lot of this stuff with the naked eye like you can 
especially when you revisit an area day after day and you're like, God, it, it just, the current is just not as good here as it was yesterday. Like you can see some, some of that stuff when you're just out there, but, but when you put a pen and paper to it and you see the actual data, then it all kind of comes together in your brain. Like, yeah, that is what happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. But even, you log, even with you that, log that stuff, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I should, but you know, I don't know when it comes to fishing information, when it comes to life information, anything in general, I can't remember shit. But when it comes to fishing shit, it sticks. And that's it's probably that works. It's probably unhealthy, but it's actually I wouldn't say that's the case, <laughs> dude. I'd say that's maybe extra healthy. Yeah. Like a lot of people nothing sticks. And they yeah. never figure out what that thing is that like they want something to stick against. Yeah. Would we like something that's more financially you know, wonderful to stick to, sure. But we got fishing. At least we know that, dude. Well, when it's the thing that makes you wake up and it's the thing that gives you purpose in life, right. then I guess I'd say that is worth something. Would the chair be comfier if we were, you know, that passionate about being a stockbroker? Maybe. But <laughs> at the end of the day, at least you're passionate about something. And it's right. weird how that works. And I'm the same way. It's called mm-hmm. ADD. Yeah. And you can't pay attention to nothing unless you are obsessed with it. Right. And I can relate. On that ADD note, so getting back to what largemouth do, yeah, yeah, <laughs> when the so water no rises one. and falls, yes, which well, <laughs> it's hey, all good. We're meandering, yeah, meandering deep water current, here. deep current here. Like yes. this is digging a little deeper than your average surface level stuff, which I freaking love. Yeah, you said like, dude, be where I get into the weeds. I was like, hey, bro, I pull weeds for a living. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just happy I haven't Large like mouth. gone off on some controversial shit yet. So that's good. I mean, hey, controversy is great. Yeah, well, I don't want to go there yet, you know, or maybe up, not at all. But I brought up, uh, you know, no, nah, I don't say it again. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I brought up Emmett Smith earlier. You know. Yeah, I remember that Emmett Smith. Gosh. Anyway. Sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. I'm not sorry. Yeah, I know. So largemouth in the summertime when the water rises, my rule of thumb typically. And it's, it's not tried and true by any means. Like, shit happens and the fish show up where they want to show up. But a general rule of thumb, if you need to get on fish quickly, they're going to go to a hard edge, you know? Like, in the, in the springtime, like you talked about earlier, you're talking about a hard, steep bank, right? In the summertime, banks are less important because there's so much stuff in the water. When, when the mats are out and all the vegetation, the emergent vegetation is fully developed, they don't need a bank anymore because there's so much sanctuary out there. But what they'll do is they'll push, like say you're you're you got a bunch of fish on a mat, duckweed mat, beautiful, perfect duckweed. Water rises two feet. The duckweed's not even there because the water rose over the weeds that the duckweed was clung to, and that floated away. It happens all the time. Usually the day of your tournament when you blistered them there. Well, hopefully you didn't blister them there, but you shook them off there the day before. Got all the little ones out of the Here's way. Here's the deal. You don't panic in that situation. The water came up overnight. They they didn't go very far. You're just going to push further back into the shit. Like, you're going to find the next thick edge, which is usually emergent vegetation. When, You know, we have what we call arrowheads on the river. They, they're like mm-hmm. stem. For people that don't know, it's a stemmed plant. They're very green, vibrant green. And they have literally like an arrowhead shape like this like a spade-shaped head on them, and they grow thick. That's, Arrows, the things that killed your ancestors. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one example of a, a hard line of vegetation that it grows a nice thick edge that they can rece- you know, retreat and get up against and feel comfortable against yeah, an edge like that. That makes sense. Rice, another edge, that's something that they can get on. Do they group up more when that happens from your experience, or do they spread out more? Because I, I could see both scenarios happening. Exactly. Both. Very area-dependent. Yeah, sure. the answer is yes. I mean, if you get in an area that, you know, everything's blown out, but there's like one island in the middle of the river that's got a high bank that protects that area, there might be a ton of fish that funnel into there because it's the only sanctuary around for them to get. But then there's other areas that have vast amounts of hard edges and all kinds of different stuff that regardless of the water level, they've got area to be in that's safe, clean, good water, lots of food. Then they kind of spread out amongst those areas a little bit more. But in general, you're going to find a bigger concentration of fish in up in the shit, further up inside that stuff. Like, let's say there's a big bay, 
Well, let's take Weaver Bottoms, for example. That's a bay I'm familiar with, right? Sure. Super vast, right? Yeah. So there's some hard edges and whatnot. But to me, rising water, to me, like, Weaver Bottoms is already, you know, pretty vast and intimidating. Yeah. Or like an Onalaska, right? Yeah. Rising water, to me, would spread those fish out more in yeah, those areas. for sure. In that particular area, you know. You and know, we don't need, I'm not talking spots, you know. I'm just, I'm. Right. I'm frame of reference point for me like understanding this but what you're saying any any large backwater expansive lake like that if you've got low water the fish are generally concentrated in the deeper parts of that body of water where there's more sparse vegetation as anglers we develop special bonds with our equipment there's something magical when you find that perfect jig rod and real combo for a technique that elevates your confidence on the water. Whether it's a perfectly balanced, crisp, and sensitive jig rod that gives you the highest level of control over your bait, allows you to feel every grain of sand, every bite, and allows you to drive that hook clean, or a rod with the perfect action and taper that seems to keep your chatter bait, swim bait, or whatever it is, in the back of the bass's head where it belongs no matter where you throw it, or a rod that allows you to effortlessly cast a lighter bait you used to cuss at on your old combo. These types of magical bonds are rare to find in a mass-produced sweatshop, which is why the Selka Fishing and Customs came to existence, with the sole purpose of bringing you closer to your passion by enhancing the bond with you, your rod, and the bass. Confidence is everything in bass fishing, and there's no bigger boner buster than losing a big fish, not feeling like you can present your bait correctly. The list goes on and on. Mr. Veselka is a full-blown artesian craftsman who can build you the perfect rod, no matter the size or action, custom exactly the way you want it. He also has a wide variety to choose from right on his website, including fan favorites like the 8-foot hair jig rod, the drop shot rod, swim bait rod, the chatter chicken rod, the MH workhorse, and more. Even ice fishing. You do the whole frozen Swiss cheese thing, the ice fishing, seen grumpy old men. Well, you can send that jiggle stick back to the antique store because Mr. Veselka builds custom ice rods in all sizes and actions too. So head on over to his website, veselkafishing.com. That's V-O-C-E-L-K-A fishing.com. To enhance your confidence on the water, feel your passion, and catch more bass, baby. Stuff that they can easily move around in and a lot of times those kind of places when the water's low they get really choked out Hmm. however when the water rises now all the places that were choked out are the places that you should be looking the choked out places are now the best cover available (coughs) and and that deeper water is often muddy or has too much current going through it or it's just too deep (coughs) bless you again wow i don't know what uh is there salt in the air i don't even know but so is it a depth factor? So, like, you're catching them in six inches, and now it's 12 inches. You know, that water level doubled where you're at, right? Yeah. Do you need to find six inches again? Is that a factor, you think? At times. I think not necessarily so much. I think there's a threshold where they can be too deep. Like, say, they're in six foot of water out in the middle of a ditch uh-huh. in the middle of the summer, low water. Now that ditch is 10 feet I think a lot of times they just don't want to be in 10 foot. That makes sense. River bass just like to be do in you like. you find the next six foot ditch or do they move like. On a high water rising situation, then? I would think they would move to a completely different deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they're not going to stay in that water as all that water comes over their head. They lose light penetration. Everything changes. They're going to recede up shallower, um, but not necessarily six foot, just to a comfortable zone. Not, or six inches, I meant. Um, not necessarily to six inches, but a comfortable zone. So three foot or less would be what I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. The depth that they you find them in is going to vary. It's all about having that cover, food, and then the depth really only matters to what you're going to present the fish. Right. And right. how you're going to fish them. Right. 
No, that makes sense. Where I was going with it was like that right. water's rising, right? They're in six inches. Now that's 12 inches. They typically move shallower, not deeper. Right. Yeah. When it's rising, right? Yeah. So, and it could be they moved to four inches if the cover's better, you know, yeah. or whatever it might be. But that makes sense. Now, here's a question. So when it's falling, you typically see them move deeper, right? Or move out? Yeah. In that scenario, definitely, again, depth doesn't matter as much as just getting out of the really thick stuff. They come out to the edges of stuff more. Um, if, if they have easy access to it, they'll get out to the mouth of something or out to the edge of the current. Sure. So that's definitely a thing. Like um, like I said before, it's the same scenario with the small mouth. When that current starts to drop and the flow or in the, the water level starts to crest and begins that plummet, it, it might only drop an inch, but that's enough where they'll get from the very far back of something, like let's say a, a little backwater bay that's 50 acres, small little pond. They're up in the very back of that in a hard line somewhere when the water's high. As soon as it starts to drop, they're on the they're on the mouth. Like no. they're not in the middle, they're not in a little bit deeper water. They get on the freaking mouth. Like they don't bike, they catch a plane to the Yeah. Mouth. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like they're on on the mouth in that current and waiting to see what's going to happen next. Like sure. and they'll hang out around that mouth for a while and usually the mouth is an intersection, you know, it's a place where you've got a channel meeting another area. So intersections are always high percentage anyway. Yeah. It's a place where they can intercept food, but also it's a place where they can kind of wait for a few days and, and continue to monitor what this river's doing. Now, again... Well, they can run and then they can walk yeah. within a, a, a square. They can still the go back. of this, right? Like for us, unless it's windy or we're going uphill, we can run and walk when we want. But when you have current... Like, you can't just decide to walk if the treadmill's moving. Yeah, five miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, you running, baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But they that's can good, get off the treadmill right there. Yeah, you know. So that's why they like that spot. Is like, oh, I'm on the treadmill. Oh, I'm not on the. Treadmill. Yeah, the flow picks back up, and we got more rain overnight. It's starting to rise again. Okay, yeah, you know what? Not ready yet. Let's go back up into that hard line. So you do, you can see that that fish movement. On a you micro, lose a little weight, hop on the treadmill. Yeah. You, oh, I'm off the yeah. treadmill, waiting for the fish to get on the bait to get on the treadmill, gain some weight, hop back on the treadmill. But yeah, I definitely noticed. I mean, just being on the front edge of when that water really starts, just barely starts to drop. That's a big deal to watch for those fish to get back on like the mouths of shit. It doesn't like talking an inch or two and. Yeah, a lot of in a lot of cases, dude. That and see. I feel like a lot of people might look at the stuff they found and think like, oh, two inches. Hey, Brody, it was, it was, we were catching them in eight inches of water. Like they'll still be there in six. Like yeah. they're gone. Like, yeah, that's cool. Cause they feel it. They feel the change. Yeah. Dude. It's not so much that they can't they're, still be there. They could still be there for another two days if they want to, but they feel the change and they know their best chance of survival they're freaking Comanche Native Americans. Like they're, <laughs> yeah. they're the Comanche. There's a spirit that communicates to them to tell them, "Get the fuck out, man! You're you're running some risky shit here." They are the Comanches. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Crazy. Yeah. I was gonna ask you how like fishing with fighter was because you fished. Uh, I think you fished the Jude with fighter before. Yep. <clears throat> and you're pretty hardcore bass nerd. Oh and yeah. And he's a little more quiet. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe he gets going with you, but I, what, what was it like fishing? What was that like? I wouldn't say he really gets going with me. There's been a lot of times, like, in the past that I fished with him that I was, like, nervous because I was, like, you know, like, I knew, you know where you stand, and you know that this guy, I'm looking up to this guy. He's not, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not, he's above my level, for sure, and so you're a little bit insecure, like, you know, especially, like, in the St. Jude, I knew that he was trusting some of my decisions that we made. Like sure. we both obviously pre-fished and we both had fish to, to fish. Um, but ultimately like the night before the tournament in the afternoon, I found a little pocket that, I mean, the water was dingy. I could barely see, but sometimes those bass, if the water color and the color of the bass lines up, right, they just have this weird glow to them. Mm -hmm. Especially when they just came in from somewhere, like they got that kind of palish look. A little lighter. I mean, I could just see their heads, and they were moving into this pocket, and 
the weather that we were supposed to have the next two days was like 82 for the high and like, you know, 60 for the low and conditions were stable. And it was like relatively high water, but stable, not falling, not rising. Everything was right. I'm like, they're lighting candles. These fish are literally water. pulling up here mm. and pff, popping yeah. in front of my eyes. I said, Marvin Gaye is said, playing in this backwater i said dude shit is gonna go down here yeah and he like to his credit if somebody said that to me and i was running the show in a tournament i would have a really hard time i'd be like dude that's awesome but like i got some good shit i want to start on my shit he was like all in he's like yep i trust you dude let's go and we went to that pocket and the rest was him you know so it was a true team deal because that dude put on a clinic on these fish that were finicky. They had just gotten on the bed. They were making them right in front of us. Like, there's one in particular that I closed my eyes and could just see it. That fish had its tail sticking straight up in the air. And it was just going like this. What position? I mean, he was, like, digging in the ground. What position is that? Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, these were mostly, like, I think they are pretty much all males, but they were big males. Yeah. Like, every single one was, like, three and three-quarter pounds. Sending dick pics back there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But this one in particular, and it, it was so determined to make that bed, you know, and it was fanning back and forth with its fin sticking straight out of the water. And we, he had such a hard fin time. Picks. Had such a hard time with that fish. We came back to it over and over and finally stuck it, and it was just, it was just cool as shit. I mean... I learned so much of that that How tournament. You, so what? It, yeah, like Sorry. I I found this, these fish that were coming to this area, but yep. I know damn well that if if it was me and one of my buddies fishing together, I know I couldn't have done what what we did yeah. because his expertise, you know, from traveling the country and and sight fishing and learning learning the intricacies of the bedfish and how to do it properly. Yeah, yeah, like it was insane. And that's what really led us. We we ended up finishing fourth. We had like thirty eight and a half pounds or thirty nine pounds for two days off of twelve fish, and you know it was it was a good time. Well, I don't know if the whole kitchen's deserved there, but like, what are what were some nuggets that you learned about sight fishing that kind of like were really a really big deal that you didn't maybe factor in prior? I think a lot of it was the patience thing. Like, I mean, we got in that little pocket and we were in there all day. And, I mean, there was more fish than we could know what to do with. But ultimately, I mean, we probably only caught, I I only caught like two fish in the two days. And and he was thrilled that I even caught one, you know. He was amazed that I even caught anything. (laughs) One of them was this dumb fish that was, I saw it swimming right next to the boat, like right by my feet. And I just dipped my little Texas rig down there just because. I'm like, yeah, this fish is going to probably run away. And he just like opened his mouth and ate it. And I just flopped it in the boat, a three and a half, three and three quarter pounder. But anyway, long story short, like we weren't getting a ton of bites because it was work. But I mean, we knew we were going to have five or six and they were going to be big. And he just had to wait them out. And I think just that gearing down like he did, like, all right, we're going to get, we're going to get a big sack. It's going to take all day. This is it. We're doing it. Here. And we just need to. And just having that mentality to literally not even for a second waver in confidence, even though, like, yeah, it took all freaking day. Most people don't have the stones to just sit there and go around and around and around. And, you know, so many times, like, by halfway through the day, we knew where, like, every damn fish was. You know, we caught maybe three or four of them, but, like, yeah, there's 20 more over here. But every time we pull up to this one, in particular, the one I referenced with the fin sticking out, something would happen, you know, he'd get the bait a little bit too far back or something and spook the fish or whatever, and you'd have to leave, let it sit for 20 minutes. We'd go over and fuck with that one over there that we also know about that's been doing some weird shit too, and it just kept cycling back through and giving fish a break to rest after we spook them and coming back and, and getting the presentation right. Maybe trying a little bit different bait or a different weight or whatever. Coming at it from a different angle. All those little things until it finally found what got that fish to bite. You know, there's so many different intricacies to the bed fishing game. You know, people think like, oh, there's one on a bed. It's just sitting there. All you do is go up and pester it until you get it to bite. That's like not, that's like, that's like the dream 
Like that never happens hardly. Unless they're there's, small mouth. <laughs> there's yeah. Yeah, that true. It, it can happen that way for sure. But like there's so many aspects like okay, is it a male? Is it a female? Did it just get there? Right. You know. Right. And you assume like 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 I talked about earlier when fish show up on a place they haven't been, usually they're chomping. But that's that's when they're just fish. When they're on a bed, it's like totally different. Like that fish is there to build a bed. It's not focused on eating. Right. So and they're also very skittish because they have nothing there to protect yet. They're territorial because that's my bed. I'm making this bed. This is my zone. So they are territorial to the bed, but yet they're not afraid to like run away, you know, for a little bit. It's just they're they're super skittish and just having that patience and mentality to, to grind out those fish was unmatched. So that's what I really yeah. took away from it. And just yeah. And I learned just a lot of other stuff from him, like just mentality stuff, you know, and just swagger. Like a lot of swagger just rubbed off on me at that time just from just seeing how he goes about it, you know? Yeah. Just like the, yeah, let's run it. You're, you know, fuck it. Do it, you know? Just having that. Less care. Yeah. Less care, which I think I care a lot, so I struggle with that sometimes. And I guess to me that is a, that is a nugget. That is hard to, it's easy to say, harder to feel and live. Yeah. And, you know, talk about mentality, though, there's, it seems like there's, there's fuck it, commit, and fuck it, not commit. And there's also, and that's the, (laughs) there's a difference between 11 a.m. commit and 2 p.m. commit, too, like. For sure, dude. You're like, oh, am I still committed that I have three in the well and I've got an hour left? Right. Like at some point, the wheels start going against you, and you're like, well, I know I said I was going to commit, but now I lost all hope and faith, and I need to do something else because I'm spinning out. The sword of Babylon, the sword of Hercules, the sword of the universe. There's one edge of that sword that is commit. The other edge is not commit. Mm-hmm. Both edges can cut your own head off. <laughs> yeah. Both Both those edges can kill a lot of shit yeah. you know so it's like which to me it's it's a matter of that that's the that's the million dollar question but i mean i've also i've also fished with him other times where it was the opposite where the situation presented itself that you needed to bail and you needed to run and gun and and try to figure something new out and whatever and and so he was obviously very capable at knowing when is the time to commit and when is the time to like there's clues the there key, was clues that day yeah. with his swagger in that backwater yeah. of committal. And there then, was clues telling him to commit telling you guys to hey, stick with this. How long did it take though? What's that for the clues? For the clues. The clues was oh we missed one or oh we caught one on a bed. And usually the missing one tells you they're on a bed. Y- yeah. Right? Well, these fish, we, he was sight fishing. And throwing back their missing one again, it's like, uh-huh. It was sight fishing. I mean, it was I got fully, You could see him. Yes. So that It was hard to see him because the water's off-colored. That'll but, make you commit for sure if oh, you yeah. can see him. Yeah. I mean, it's a different type of deal. A lot of people, when they think of sight fishing, you know, people picture that you can always see this bass. You can always see your bait. And that is so often not the case. Even on clear bodies of water, like, half the time they're up underneath something where, like... You may only see a lip, like you see like a little loop, a little lip flash or something weird. And you're like, is that a fish? And then you just like stare at that spot. Having good eyesight is big, but also like just understanding that, hey, you're not always going to see the whole picture, but you need to be constantly vigilant to see a sign. Like a lot of these fish that we're sight fishing on the Mississippi River, it's not what you think it is. You catch a glimpse. Yeah. And so you put your bait in there where you think you saw that glimpse and you just watch to see if you see any movement. And then a lot of times, like, it takes a while to build the picture of what's really happening there. And all of a sudden you realize, yeah, that is a bass. And yeah, it is on a bed. And, oh, I thought that was its head, but that's actually its tail. And now you start casting 10 inches over to the right because now you realize you've been throwing in the wrong spot. And all of a sudden... Oh, oh, my line's going off. You know, that's that's sight fishing to me is where it's not like you're seeing it all happening, but you're getting glimpses that make you make those adjustments 
until it finally you kind of figure out the zone and, and catch them, you know? Yeah. But yeah. he was just really good at, at seeing that quicker, probably from experience of sight fishing all over different places like Toledo Bend where you have that variable water color, you know, and places like the river's not the only place that has that off-colored water where you're going to sight fish. Florida, I mean, yeah. it's hard to see in yeah. that off-colored water. But in, and if you if you can do that, that's a huge advantage. And I think that's For what sure. the, the true sight fishing um, experts, I think that's one of their big back pocket items is being able to see a bass or see enough of what they need to see faster and better than the average guy. They got, it's almost like they're looking at little dart boards and they know which, where the bullseye is to look for. Yeah. And like, based on my conversations with people who are good at sight fishing or no good sight fishermen, it's like, they know how to identify that, the lip, that thing on the bottom lip or that thing on the fin or that thing on the tail or whatever it might be to clue them in quicker, I think, than a lot of other people. And then you maybe never see the full fish, right? But Mm -hmm. you, you. You get them, you're, it's almost like looking for that light piece of whatever when you're bed fishing or that dark spot or light spot when you're bed fishing. Right. You get clued into little pieces of that, right? And it's just it's fascinating to me. What always gets the hair on the back of my neck standing up is when you can't see shit, you, you have determined that you're 90% sure that there is a fish there, but you're still a little bit on that edge, you know? Yeah. And then yeah. you make a pitch and all of a sudden you see a you can't see shit because it's a dark, a bass with a dark back. And all of a sudden it goes like this. It tilts just a tiny bit. And you see that, that golden flash. Yeah. Yeah. That gets me every time, dude. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like he just turns a little bit and you see the side of him and that, yeah. that flash, like the flash of a shiny crankbait in the sunlight. And sometimes you even see that lateral line and you're like, I can't believe I it just is, saw that. Like it just is so. Yeah, it's almost awesome. like they winked at you. Like that's yeah. what you live for, dude. Right. Well, and also it's usually a strong indicator that They're, what you just did is leading towards yeah. you're gonna catch that fucking fish. Yeah, they just moved on. <laughs> they just they just they reacted to your bait. Is that a senko or whatever? Like he didn't fully go down on it, but he twitched when it went in there, and you're like, "Yep, this one's mine," and like four more casts at the latest. So yeah, that's. Yep. Yeah, babbling, but no, we've all seen that walk by, and we triggers. look back at it, and yeah, like that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, is there like a type of cover you notice they spawn on in the backwaters? We ain't gonna talk about what type it is, but is there a type of cover where it's like bingo bango? Yeah, I mean a lot of it. That's dep- how it is for smallies. It seems like a little bit on those natural lakes. I yeah, I know what you're talking about. Every yeah, it's spawning in general for smallmouth. It seems like looking for a type of bottom type of cover type of something something yeah or a three different ones. But you know, it definitely varies on the river just from water level and there's fish that there's smallmouth even that spawn up in some pretty swampy areas. Like it's always it w- those kind of fish tend to get more on like wood and stuff like that next you know yep, that makes sense but you know they're just like you're saying bottom composition the whole area might be all silty but by that piece of wood there's one there's like one little sandy area that's cleaned out like not as soft bottom that they find and mm-hmm. how they can find just that tiny little spot it's pretty impressive to me but it, it is but it'll blow your mind you're way up in the back ass end of something and catch smallmouth spawning you know that's pretty neat to see um but Largemouth, yeah, it, it really depends a lot on water level. You know, low water, they're going to spawn on more, like, of your traditional bottom composition type stuff on a bank. But when the water's super high, sometimes they spawn on, they get behind a big-ass maple tree and just spawn on the roots. That makes sense. And that maple tree is normally land. But if that's all they got, that's what they're going to do. Well, speaking of land, let's let's think outside the box for a second, right? Here's a weird question for you. So, if a smallmouth could spawn, like if a smallmouth could live on land, where would we find them? Ah, uh, probably on. I mean, just gravel roads, man. Dirt just roads. beyond the roads, 
be Jason Aldean in that shit? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dirt yep. Road Anthem. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Uh, or would it be Brooks and Dunn, like them red dirt roads? <laughs> nah, that would, yeah. Not That's the a red little dirt. too soft, you know? Yeah, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. They need, that, they need that gravel that it gets, you know. You don't think that if, you had, if it was sunny, I think they'd be up on the gravel road. If it was cloudy, I think they'd be more like right on the ditch where the, uh, right where the, <laughs> right where it starts to depress, like right on the edge or on the top of the ditch, right where the gravel turns into, you know, the dusty grass. Yeah. <laughs> This is this is way too over far? my head. Too far? Too intergalactic? No, I, I like it. I do. We can reel it back. Sometimes I like to think about, like... I just brought you to the uh, abstract land. This which is, is abstract. I which love is it. familiar, but obviously, like, I've confused you. Like, we are... A little bit, but... We've gone above the surface. I'm thinking... So, a lot of times, you know, the Mississippi River Valley is a really special place. You know, obviously, it's because... Part of it's because the Mississippi River exists there, and I love the river. But also, like, when you think about the valley and what it means, I mean, that valley has been cut, well, for one, by glaciers, but also that, that river cuts the valley over thousands of years. And I think about, like, what how interesting would it be if they f built a dam like the Hoover Dam, like just a fucking massive dam that went from bluff to bluff yeah. and filled it all with water and all of lacrosse was 100 feet deep and... You know, yeah. like these that, are the wonderful I, thoughts. Yeah, that I, love. I think yeah. about that shit all the time. Like, yeah. so where where would I be fishing then? You know, like, all right, I'm up in like. I like this. Yeah. So like, then it would be truly like a southern impoundment, right? So like, for sure, my parents live in one of the, the reservoir of lacrosse. There's like the main main river valley, but then there's all these trout streams and tributaries that come into the river, and they all have these valley like sub valleys that go off of the main big valley yep so that those would be your creeks i mean and i'm just thinking about that all the time like my parents live in this little valley within a valley so that's like a little bay that would be like a spawning pocket right right, right. off the main lake yeah, yeah yeah you know so i think about yeah. that shit all the time like yeah and i think honestly like there's shell beds right where the current <laughs> funnels in this cul-de-sac and it's yeah. kind of like this like <laughs> if the mississippi river was right turned next to the basketball hoops if they turned the mississippi into a reservoir like like kentucky lake i i feel like it would be like it would be like gunnersville man it would be like fucking amazing It'd it might take sick. some time to like shit to figure things out yeah settle. you gotta bounce your jig off off the three beer taps and but just then... think of how fertile the river is like just yeah. the water the, sh the water shed that drains the mississippi river is so fertile and there's so many species of fish and so like every fish does well like yeah we don't have trophy fish um trophy perch and trophy crappies at times maybe and catfish and walleyes but but as far as the bass are concerned it's not like a trophy fishery but overwhelmingly healthy across the board at all species of fish and it just makes you think like man if this was some sort of giant reservoir how good would it freaking be dude i think we need to go to like i don't know Let's if this would be petition. a community up. board meeting or like a state board meeting and i don't know what comes first with this but like you either it's either we're not gonna pull current for four years or we're gonna build up this dam <laughs> x hundred more feet <laughs> And then we're not going to pull current for six years. We should do this and film it and like go in wearing like, what was that? Like people that tried to run for president or something a few years back. There was a guy that wore like pants on his head or something, wasn't there? Yes. We could be just like come off as like complete crazy people and be like, we need to flood the Mississippi River now or millions of people are going to lose their lives. Here's the deal. <laughs> Bass fishing is one of the number one growing industry sports that we've ever seen. And I don't think our resources have the capacity to handle this demand. Live scope so sales are I, through the roof. Live scope sales are through the roof. So, Kate and I, we are petitioning to create more resource. We're going to start with flooding. We put flood nine or eight first. What are we rising? We're actually going to blow out the dam down in Genoa, and we're going to make one. It's going to be all one from from Lynxville to Trempolo. So three pools. We're going to call it Pool 89. <laughs> yeah. Eight and nine together. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Or 8-9. <laughs> yeah. 8.9. Okay. 
Yeah. I eight, feel like... Eight, 8.5. Split the gap. Wait, do I have to talk in the Southern No, nation? we're done. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not as good as you. You're fucking better from the sounds of it. Mm. I don't know. Like a modern day wider. <laughs> <laughs> I think, here's the deal. I think if you built the dam to the top of the bluffs, it would be more than just two pools because that water is going to back up so fucking far. It would go like to Red Wing at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. further. I mean, this uh, this would be like a biblical reservoir, and like millions of people would be displaced. Like we're talking the next Kentucky Lake. Probably bigger. Post genocide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of where the best ledges would be. Get your ark <laughs> ready. Where? The, oh yeah, dude. Mm-hmm. Like. Man. We'd be like drop shotting these wing dam, these old wing dams in a hundred feet of water. I see one problem with your plan. Isn't there a? Are you ready to reel in your next home purchase or refinance? Supreme Lending's Dream Team can help guide you through the entire mortgage process, from pre-qualification to closing. They have a wide variety of home loan programs in their tackle box, including down payment assistance and first time home buyer options. Just ask me. I trusted Aaron Dagus, a bass fisherman just like you and me, and Supreme Lending's Dream Team to help finance my first home. Contact Aaron Dagus and the Dream Team today by scanning the QR code or giving them a call at 763 763- Three two six zero six seven seven. That's seven six three three two six zero six seven seven. Did I catch a seven in there? Or visit their website, Aaron Dagus dot Supreme Lending dot com. That's A A R O N D A E G E S dot Supreme Lending dot com. Vision Carp in Lacrosse or the Flying. Yeah, they'd probably go crazy. Ape right, shit. you give them. You well, know, before more we room. build our reservoir, what we would That's do what, yeah. is we would fully drain it all the way down, kill and everything, wrote note it, full genocide. Yeah, yeah. But above, we would take we now. would take a male and female of each species and put them in a holding tank, and we call it the ark. Gotcha. And then when we reflood it, we put them all back in and let them just, because that's how science works. You just put you know one of each thing, and then. It's just, there'll be millions like next year. And we write a book before it's built and after. And <laughs> we call the first one <laughs> the new bestrology, the old bestrology <laughs> testament. And we call, you know, once it's all built and done, you know, then we, you know, kind of take out the bad stuff and, you know, <laughs> yeah. erase the shit that we regret from like the old test, old bestrology testament. And then we write this nice new testament that's all like, yeah. Hey, we built this how we like. Yeah. Exactly how we wanted. <laughs> Holy shit! So we had talked before this about how we were gonna start like kind of a religious cult, and it was a joke. But like, we kind of have the Honest. the building blocks started right now. I just we've got the folklore like like the, the foundation. Yeah. Of it covered. Yeah. And it all starts with just building a giant reservoir, which is pretty sick. It's it actually kind of feasible at this point. Dude, honestly, I think you might be onto something with this like religion thing. Cause like that's how obsessed we are with bass fishing. <laughs> it is almost a religion. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I worship it. Yeah. Right. I bow to it. And like the bass gods. Through like, all the bad the times. The fear of the bass gods. Of, like your shit not working or like right. you know, like it's and what about all the bad times you've ever had in life? Like, what got you through it? Right. Randy Howell, Bassmaster Classic Champion. <laughs> that wasn't the wall I got. Yeah, no shit. Those are the bass gods, man. Right. They're so... <sighs> wow. And it's always there. Wow. This, is, this has been really productive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got in the weeds. No, but like, okay, bass religion, what, what is like, what, do you, what would you call it? I feel like it needs to, you know, yeah. it needs to carry a little weight. I mean, you you floated astrology, but that kind of rings more towards... That's more Bass Galaxy marketing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Kidding. Yeah. Like, like that type of thing. I get it. Gosh, why didn't I pick up on that? See, Bastronaut, like I said... Bastroid. When, when it comes to information, 
like I said, if it isn't fishing, it's just like uh, oh, for uh, sure, I dense, get it. Density right here, but fishing, I'm like <laughs> right? No, it's like no, it's it's a cult, it's a religion, it's mm-hmm. uh, like if I I could easily probably be fooled in joining one and just like following somebody. Maybe we are and we don't know it. You know how we're like brainwashed. Wait, like, is, is Boyd Duckett? Is he the? Is he? Do we just like wake up, like you know when they like re- wake up and realize, Fuck. holy shit, he's banging all of these women. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, Jim Jones, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, like there's cops here. Like, oh fuck, I'm in a cult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe we just woke up. Holy shit. Except I still want to do it. I still want a bass fish. Yeah. So like, we'll si- start a new one, and it'll. We promise it will be better. Than the old one. But then 20 years from now, we're probably going to end up being the bad guy. Because that's how history just like repeats itself. Right. I feel like the prophecy (laughs) needs to involve like some sort of, you know, written testimony as well as, you know, like, like what they do with the UFO stuff. Like it's only passed orally, never written. (laughs) You know, and you have. I don't oral, know exactly like, what you're talking about, but like, I assume that you're absolutely correct. That's I. I just watched a weird podcast, <laughs> ro- a Rogan podcast, oh, okay. with this chick who's like studied like UFO crash sites and shit, and yeah, she okay. was talking about like the people who actually know shit. They don't even write it down. They just oh, they they only communicate that information orally, and it's like a tradition, almost like a religion, like alien. And UFO, NASA shit, that's almost like bass fishing. It's a religion, right? Kind of thing is what I'm starting to learn. Um, so I think if we're going to start this bass fishing religion that you're talking about, and this is, you know, something that people are going to get behind, I feel like we, you, you, there needs to be a book with almost uh, <laughs> chapters, right? Books have chapters. So, like, you've got this... Maybe the first book is the book of Cade or what what have you, where this reservoir is created, right? In in yeah. the cross. Where, yeah. where where you drain the cross and then you flood it like and you make it the best ledge fish and destination in in all the in land. All the land. <laughs> best ledge fish and destination north of the Mason Dicks and God dang it. <laughs> God damn. And the bass gods cried tears of joy. I'm going to think about this shit all the way home and probably for the next, like, three years. Yeah, dude. While I write those chapters. You know, and, and I think it could be a sub-religion of the Christian faith. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't think it needs to replace anything that people currently believe. But, you know, it's preposterous to think that there's not something else out there. You can't say there's not a bass god. There could be. And, it could uh, be a bass every, god, dude. Yeah. And while everybody always assumes that God is like a human being ex- existing, yeah, like, but it could literally just be a fucking bass, right? That's just like pulling all the strings. Like, sir, do you understand? You just described like a tall white male. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> it's like... Fuck out of here. What is going on? Too far? No. Have we gone too deep? What's the deepest river bass you've caught not wintering? God. That, that's, that's hard. A, honestly a curious one for me, like in all curiousness. Well, when the water gets super clean in the fall, I mean, I've caught some, you know, 14, 15 foot down. But it's a clarity thing at that point. Dirtier, shallower, cleaner. Deeper. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like when you talk about fish that are set up on wing dams, like it's no secret that you're gonna find some smallmouth on wing dams at certain times in the year. It's funny how we just like go right back into like serious talk after all that. So, I had to break so it up funny. a little bit. Now so we're funny. back. I yeah, know. we're back. I like we're being back. back. But yeah, I'm back. So like those fish, when the water's got that more classic river stain, like one and a half foot, two foot visibility. Those fish are a lot of times going to be like in the perfect little feeding zone right behind the dam. Like you bring a bait over that dam and boom, you know, you get bit right away. As the water cleans up, 
a lot of guys will, you know, people notice that, wow, you know, I'm getting a lot of bites, like, halfway back to the boat from the wing dam. And a lot of people come to think that, oh, those fish have pulled off the wing dam and they're just kind of behind it in the middle. But live scope has taught us a lot about that situation, right? So a lot of times what's happening is those fish are still, like, behind the dam. They're a little bit deeper because of the water clarity. Like, they just want to be a little bit deeper in that cleaner water. But they're tracking the bait further now. And where the bite actually comes is closer to the boat. So there's that dynamic there where in the past we started to think that, wow, these fish are like in the middle between the wing dams. But really, they're not. They're just following it all the way there. And that's the point where they got to make the decision. Either I'm going to bite it or this thing's getting away. And that's when you get the bite. That makes sense. But LiveScope has showed us that for every one of those interactions, that like, oh, he followed it and bit it. There's like 40, <laughs> you know, it drives yeah. me absolutely insane. Like how many yeah. of them follow it and never bite? That's what's sometimes it's almost me. like, God, I kind of wish I could just go back to not seeing how many, not just seeing that. and be like, Oh wow. I caught this it one halfway back to the boat and just think that it was one fish. Cause I was just better off. I was better off when I thought there was one rogue fish there. It's one of them. Fill it that. Okay. That's a philosophical question. <laughs> yeah. That is a deep philosophical question that we can explore real quick, and I'm just wondering if I could borrow one of your one of your one of your lip pillies there, bud. Yeah, bud. I can't. I have a log in there. I can replace replenish you, and it's uh, it's just Jesus far Christ. away. And what I know what kind of ghetto ass you think I am, dude. I like you. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Any day. The philosophical question is ignorance bliss. You know what I mean? The that answer. is live scope or no live scope, right? Is ignorance bliss kind of like, okay, would you rather not see like the Israel, Palestine, like actually what's happening? Do you want to see dead people? Do you want to see those bodies blowing up and know about all that? Or is it better just to not? Is it, do you want to know about aliens or is it better to not? Do you want to see all the fish that follow your bait back to the boat? Or would you rather yeah, not? If, if you could have the hindsight and be like, so, how did I end up for that day? Because if the answer is you won the tournament, well, then you're like, well, I guess it didn't matter. Right. But when you had a bad tournament, it's always that 2020 deal. Like, your yeah. 2020 vision, you know, hindsight's 2020. So, um, yeah, when you sucked, looking back, you're like, yeah, I kind of wish I just didn't know that all those fish were there because maybe I would have done something different sooner. But then when you do good, then you don't question it. It's one of those stupid things, like... Dude, but I totally. think I've gotten a lot better the last few years on the river. The river's not the live scope capital of America by any means. Like you're not seeing your bait as far out there as you are on Lake Hartwell, clear bodies of water with no current. Like it's it's tough to see that bait consistently really far out and watch fish eat your bait. Like it's just there's so many variables that make it tougher. But you see enough shit going on that it clues you in for sure. I mean even if you don't see your bait, if you see five blobs stationary and then all of a sudden all five of them are moving in a direction that's towards your boat at relatively the same speed you're reeling, you can pretty much guess that they're probably following your shit. Right. Like right, that's that right. much you can see pretty easily on the river. And um, <clears throat> and part of it too is, yeah, maybe I need to get better at, I'm sure some of the top live scopers can still see their shit on the river better than I can for sure. But what the I'm getting at makes it a little tougher for them to keep their bait in front of the fish. Cause I think, yeah, aside from like today and that scenario, I think a lot of times those fish want it mo- coming with the current, yeah. I think, or to some extent, unless that current is changing directions. Right. That is, right. So I think that does make it tougher. Like them good live scopers are good at keeping the bait above the fish all right. the way back to the boat. And I think that's where, not to argue with you, but I think no. that's ultra challenging when we're talking about a river in a current situation. Right. Uh, one thing that it has taught me, though, with that is, like, I've kind of learned the threshold of, like, all right, when they're following it off of a piece of structure, I expect to get the bite, right? And if I don't get the bite and I throw back in and they do it again mm-hmm. and stop and I don't get a bite and then I throw back in and they... It seems like every time you do that, 
the distance that they'll follow that bait seems to get less and less and less and they lose interest in it. So you got to read what's going on. Even like I said, even though I suck at seeing that bait consistently, I can see how the fish change their mood. And I know when it's time to pick up the trolling motor a lot quicker than before. Will you pick up a different bait before you do that? I think the, I don't Sometimes, know the answer. Sure. Sometimes it depends on the spot for sure. Yeah, yeah. And the day and what's been going on. And, but a lot of the stuff I'm talking about too is like community shit. So like, mm-hmm. I'm not afraid to fish community shit. I've won a lot of money off of community the shit. It's good. And, and a lot of times you pull up on something community and, and you see that stuff going on and you know, yes, part of it may be the day. Like maybe if the wind was blowing and there was a storm coming, maybe every one of them would have just gobbled your shit like crazy. It happens. Definitely happens. Even on like the obvious community stuff, It you get the right day and you can look like a hero. But typically those more pressured fish are more reluctant to bite because they've seen so much stuff and... So if I'm in a tournament scenario, it's like I'll pull up on that stuff, make a few casts, and I can generally read how they're following my stuff. Like, Then you have that decision to make, for sure. Like, yeah, do I want to pick up a Carolina rig and try to grind through them, or do I just bail? And lately what's really got me in the check line a lot more is just bailing. Because if I can run 30 of those places, yeah, maybe it only takes two minutes to pick up a Carolina rig and make two three casts but then if i do that on the next spot now i'm up to six minutes and i do that on the next spot now i'm up to nine minutes you know how many places i can run in nine fucking minutes yeah and and that's something i'm hearing you loud and clear because i'm the guy that throws carolina rig well and i am too well and that's it's it's hard to get yourself not to because you have confidence in the spot you also have have confidence in your abilities you have you have all this confidence that but yet, and if you're not a river rat like me, you maybe don't have 30 more yeah. to run no, to. No, for sure. And honestly, that's the biggest thing is I usually can find, you know, five to six areas maybe to run to, maybe more, but like sometimes two to four that I want to key in on. But even, one to three. even if you only have three spots. Areas or spots or, yeah. Let's say you got three wing dams that, yeah. that have been good to you that week. I would rather, rather than keep grinding on fish that don't seem to want to bite, I'd rather go back to wing dam number one that I haven't been to in two hours that I know there's fish on and try them again and see if there's a, something changed because the fish have timing windows. Yeah, I and, and when I say three or four, it's rotating. Three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think you're better off in that scenario more often than not, statistically, from my point of view, Yep. Like, yeah, maybe you sit there for 20 minutes and grind one out on the Carolina rig and it's a kicker and you win the tournament. Maybe. Maybe. It but maybe you go back to number one and catch three, four pounders and win the tournament. Maybe. Statistically, over time, what seems to bear out for me is the second decision pays off better than the first decision. And that's what it's all about. I mean, that's when I win tournaments and do well, it's not because I had a better spot. It's because I made a decision. That For impacted sure. the day positively at some point. And a lot of times it's a spot I didn't pre-fish. Just a spur of the moment thought like, let's go hit this quick. And then all of a sudden you pull up and it goes down and, and you're like, holy shit. Yeah, we're good. Let's go in. Well, and to your point, we, we <coughs> just touched on it. The whole, I mean, a lot that we didn't touch on like how fish eat a Carolina rig here one day. And a swim bait here the next with the same cast. Yeah. We talked about how fish move and how much the river changes and how water level and flow affects that change. So when we're when we're taking that into consideration and then we're talking about your decision making process. Now you put it all together. Now you put it all together. And it makes sense, right? Because the water it, if there's one thing that's for sure, it's change when it comes to the river. So you moving around more yeah, is going to allow you to adapt to change better than staying in one place yeah, and understanding that it changed, but not learning how or where. Yeah. You know? Sure. So that makes like, 
uh, sorry, I, I, I think no. out loud sometimes, and I'm putting all this together, and it's just, it's been a really cool, fun time. Well, the way you're wording that, it really helps put it, because I feel like there's been moments on both sides here where we've kind of rambled, but then when you really get back to it in, in summary like that, we actually put together a pretty good package here today. Dude, Like, yeah. from start to finish, end, yeah. fish movements, you know, and then understanding that once you have them found, once you understand their movements, now it's about timing decisions and really just rotating. It, it, it's hard. It's really hard. It takes a lot of work, a lot of practice, but you just have to know kind of when to pull the plug or when to stay. Yeah. It's always the hard one. D- it's but, the hardest one, and there's a gut factor to the, the good, really factor. good guys I know. They spend a lot of time on the water like you, and that – that decision that a lot of people struggle with, myself included, even good guys included, right? The, the guys who seem to adjust the best, there's a gut factor that mm. tells them to stay or go. A hundred percent. And, you know, it helps having a lot of history on the same place, fishing a lot of tournaments over and over off the same place. There's no doubt. It helps a lot. Right. I mean, there's places now that I used to fish all the time that, like, like over time you're like, okay, Yes, I do catch four pounders off of this spot from time to time, but I've stopped there 10 different times in 10 different tournaments, and not one freaking time have I ever caught a big one there. There's certain places like that that I've just completely, like, nixed from my milk run. Like, I am not going to stop there in a tournament, no matter how bad I want to. It happened one time. Because I'm a man of statistics. It's like, dude, dude, if it statistically just doesn't work more often than not, Yeah, maybe today's the day that it was going to work and I blew it by not stopping there, but I'd rather take that chance statistically that today was the day it wasn't going to work and I'll go somewhere where I think I have a better statistic chance of getting a bite. And yes, that plays into being a local. Like you said, it helps when you've got access to 100 different places you can go at any given time. It's not that easy when you only have three places that you found, you know? Yeah, yeah. But... Just understand, even if you had a terrible practice and you've never been to a fishery before and you only know three spots, you don't have to be married to those three spots. If you're sucking, just sometimes you're better off just running a bunch of random shit that looks good because you're, you're, upping, is that. you're upping that statistical odds that you're going to land on them by moving and trying different stuff and keep just keep moving, keep making observations and adjustments. Because if you had three spots and you've already fished all three and you never got a bite, okay, are you going to keep fishing the same three? Right. What are your statistical chances that <laughs> if you haven't caught one all day, what are the three the, the statistical chances that those three spots are suddenly going to produce for you? Probably not that good. Unless the water level is pushes them there, right? Or the flow pushes them there. Yeah. Statistically, right? Unless that change is happening that direction right. and you're on the exact front end right. of that, you're the first guy. Yeah. You're still right. Statistically, statistically still unlikely. The, yes. And that's you want to be the second guy. Yeah. Like nobody got the, nobody was the first guy. Yeah. And you're the second guy. Like, and, and that's why too, a lot of times like, like last year, for example, you look at how I did in the Toyota series tournaments. I fished, the three plains division tournaments they went really badly for me like it was a humbling experience but like i look at what i did at kentucky lake you know i zeroed both days at grand lake i have nothing to even say about that tournament hey so move forward to kentucky lake you know i caught three the first day i made a big long run to barkley i thought i had a chance like i caught some giant like two giant smallmouth down there so it was like a zero or hero kind of deal and it ended up only caught three day two I caught three again. I could have, I could have caught a limit, right? Like I had something figured out. I I could have caught ten pounds of largemouth that day for uh-huh. sure. Sure, sure. But where I was in the point, or where I was sitting in the tournament after only catching three the first day, it almost makes again double down. You go back to the statistics. You're like, yeah, cool. I can go catch a limit and save face. But who gives a fuck about saving it's face? Are you kidding as me? Well. Like, what what good does it? What difference does it? It also makes you double down the wrong direction. Yeah, which twenty twenty you would have done it differently. No, I think I still would have done it. But it makes you double down the wrong direction. It puts Sometimes you, you, when your back's against the wall and you only catch three the first day, or you catch ten pounds, 
and there's and you're after largemouth, a big bag, and they're after the spotted bass are winning seventeen pounds. Yeah. You ain't gonna freaking make up ten to seventeen pounds with a spotted bass limit. You right. have to double down. Right. That's I guess where I was relating to your story. Well carry on. I guess what I was saying there is statistically in my mind, my odds of moving up because getting a check in that tournament, even though I only had three for I don't know if it was seven pounds or it might have only been two actually on the first day for five something, I think it was. I think that's what it was. Two for five fourteen or something. Even though I had such a low weight, the weights were overall low in that tournament. Like sure. getting a check was still in reach. I if I went out and sure. caught 14 pounds i'm still getting a check so in my head all right i know i can go catch 10 pounds i'm still gonna fall short of a check my statistical best chance of catching 14 plus is just completely fishing random shit that i've never seen or fished before so i did that it didn't work out but now do that 10 tournaments where you do that like all 10 times you're in a bad spot because statistically your chance of doing well after only catching two are not good but in 10 tournaments of bad luck the first day, if I cash in two of those because I decided to go run new water, that was worth it. Right. That's the way my brain works. Like, I know that I'm going to go out and probably be fucked either way. So I might as well go try something else, and it might end up working out, and then I salvage a check and I learn something. I, yep, yep. You know? Yep, yep. That's where I'm at with it. Dude, I do I the same thing. Really good way I do the same thing on the river, and it it works better for me on the river because I'm usually not so far out of check range. If I have a bad start, I usually can recover because of my history. It's such and a experience. good place to ad lib if you have that experience. Like you can, because stuff changes, right? So you just look for your reading water, reading current, reading. Yeah. You so know, just know finding that new little nook. When you see me throw up a double zero on Grand Lake, or you see me catch 14 pounds on day one at Lake of the Ozarks and only two bass or whatever it was on day two, or th- I think I had three. Either way, struggled day two. It's because every time that happens to me, it's because I, I knew I was already fucked day one, and so I did something different on day two with the hopes. Like, I knew my only shot was to do something different, and yeah, statistically, mo- it works out like 30% of the time, but... Either way, I'd rather have that that thirty percent where you actually do good and something happens, than if you just do the same thing both days. Eighty percent of the time, now you're not. You're ninety percent of the time, you're not cashing. If that makes sense. It does, and and I guess it was it was today was really cool because I I got to fish the river with you and I got to see, you know, how you made decisions and how you adjusted, and it was cool to watch you. We you know, had some flurries, then it got a little tough. And when it got tough, I, I noticed, you know, how you adjusted to that. And it was really cool how, you know, you would make the, you made the best of that touch tough situation. You stopped throwing what was working when we got there. Right. Yeah. And I didn't bring that, but that's so like, and then you found a little nook and a cast where you catch bang, 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 two, three of them. And then bang, 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 two, three of them. It's like, dang, now that, we're like, we're back, baby. But you, you, you and one of those was the biggest of the day, mind it you. It was, and it was sick, dude. And I had a blast just watching because I, I, I learned it's a sport where you never stop learning. And just, um, I think how specific casts are where you're, where you land your bait, knowing where it's going to sweep and where the, where the current's going to put that bait um, knowing that that changes based on whether you cast, you know, based on where your boat's positioned based to where you want the bait to, to be right. If you're throwing up or down or 45, 45 up or down current, you're you leading with that bait. Like you're just very in tune and yeah. it's, it, I think it's because you do fish year round and you are like, you like I was picking up rust again is what I realized is like, it was my first time out since December holding the rod and casting. And it was like rust. And I noticed, dude, you're sharp. Like it seemed like you were fishing two days ago in, in a boat is what it felt like today. You're sharp. And it was cool to watch you do your thing. And, and I'm just, I'm grateful that, you know, you let me hop in the boat with you, dude. Thank you. dude. I appreciate those compliments. And that's what I've been saying it for a long time. A lot of my friends, like even good friends that, hang it up and as soon as tournament season's over and 
it may or may not make a big difference in my fishing, but it makes a big difference in my confidence. Which it does ter- when you get in the boat with which anybody, in turn, it doesn't. Which in turn makes a big difference in my fishing, I believe, because when I'm confident that I'm, like you said, sharp, and that sharpness comes because I don't let myself go more than a, a month without catching an open water bass. I lost my th- first three bass today. Did you notice that? My thir- my first three yeah. fish today, I lost. That and part of that might have been the bit. bait. They did, they, did, they were, were kind of nipping at it, but yeah. But like, you know, getting that touch, that feel, dude, you're just a basser. Like <laughs> as hardcore as it gets, and and that's true. I think that's why we relate well together, and I think that's why this has been such like a cool conversation, very unique, very in depth, and very I think you know special for me, dude. It was like entirely selfishly awesome for me it was Whether awesome people for me like too. it or not i don't care dude i don't I, either i i've had a blast talking to you so me so, too man what's on the horizon this year for you i guess what so we it's talked a, about the past a little bit the present rivers but let's let's hop into a crystal ball quick this podcast is brought to you by my compadre my tournament partner my brother and the best rod builder above the Mason-Dixon line, Veselka Fishing and Customs. Specializing in custom fishing rods. That's right. Hand-built fishing rods, custom-made and tailored how you want, whether it's by length, action, specific technique, balance, or anything you want. Anything. Veselka Fishing and Customs can build it. Mr. Veselka also has a wide variety of rods to choose from, which we've had a lot of fun with, perfecting and testing. The most unique and famous rod developed at Veselka Fishing and Customs is his custom Marabou hair jig rod. Have you thrown the old Canadian dinner mint, the Harry Gary, the fighter fly, the old thin Lizzie? If you have, then you know these little fluff balls can be hard to cast, especially at those key sizes as light as 1 16th of an ounce. Well, what if I told you you could cast that marabou jig 30 to 50% farther than you're casting it now? What if I told you you don't have to spook those shallow, skittish smallmouth? Well, with the custom hair jig rod from Veselka Fishing and Customs, not only can you cast a lot further, But the way this rod loads up on a long cast is pure perfection. This balanced rod has the perfect backbone with a light action parabolic taper that keeps those fish pinned without breaking your line. Mr. Veselka utilizes an 8 foot custom fly fishing blank converted to a spinning rod and couples it with premium guides leading up to custom fly guides that allow maximized casting distance and reduced line friction and blank slap, maximizing your overall performance, obviously. And we found this rod is not only perfect for marabou hair jigs, but for any light bait you need to cast far, including small swim baits, spy baits, and more. Any light bait you need to cast far, look no further than the Veselka Fishing and Customs Hair Jig Special. So head on over to his website, veselkafishing.com, that's V-O-C-E-L-K-A fishing.com, and treat yourself to the custom hair jig rod or any custom rod you can dream up. This year is going to be pretty freaking special, I think. I mean, whether or not it works out is another story, but it's going to be so much fun for me because we have such a unique opportunity, Um, you know. Pro fishing is headed in a direction that I'm not super happy about. You know, it's been my lifelong dream to like go pro someday. And that dream's faded just a little bit for me because I feel like it's it's just that sport's changing at that level. But there's still a, a very good level to be at in the local regional level, you know, where my goal is every year I'd like to fish at least one or two tournaments that can lead to something bigger. So that way there's still that sliver of a dream that like, Hey, you make this national championship and somehow win it. You got a foot in the door, you right? You got to hold on to your dream yes. to an extent. There's, you it's know? there, dude. It's, it's like always going to be it. there. It's never going to go away. If, if my time comes and I'm 62 years old and I somehow win the Bassmaster Classic at 62 and break some sort of record for that, I don't know what the record is, but then I'll certainly pursue that at that time. Like if I'm able, right? Dude, that's your kid, and only a psychopath sells their kid. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. You know it. what I mean? Like, you can't let go of that. So, I in th- the fact that lacrosse has become more nationally publicized, it's bringing bigger tournaments. Like, there's no denying it. Dude, yeah, you and have so some options. It's, it's becoming a little bit, it's not Texas, right? You can't win a boat every weekend. But it's becoming a little bit more and more feasible. To be a, a local guy that's making good money fishing at home. It's a prime spot in, in working a full time job. Four state area that we live in. I mean, cut Wisconsin in half. You know, it's the be- it's the most prime spot for what you're talking about. Yeah. So it's like you look at like the perfect example, like the dream example is like a Todd Castledine type, you know, of this region. Like yeah, yeah. anything that comes through the Mississippi River. And, you know, even throw Winnebago system and a lot of these areas around here with big money tournaments, I'll be there. You know, that's what that's what I want to do for the next 15, 20 years. Just be a basser and fish big tournaments. And if I got a chance to go to a bigger tournament, I'm going to go to that bigger tournament, whether it's the All-American, Bass Nation Nationals, you know, Bassmaster Open, Toyota, anything that comes through here. And then I'm always going to try to force myself to dabble a little bit. You know, like last year I dabbled in the Toyotas. Fish three divisions, you know, or three tournaments in the Plains Division. That was my my learning experience. I want to do something outside my comfort zone every year. This year, love that. We got some major opportunities, and yeah, so to do. start yeah. off, we've got um, the Bass Nation qualifier. They changed their format, as many of you know. For those that don't know, the Nation is now they still have their Federation club level stuff. State tournament, divisional tournament, go to the nationals. But now they've added four qualifying tournaments throughout the nation where um, you can fish that tournament, and if you finish a certain place, you go straight to the nationals. So you don't have to be in a bass club. You don't have to fish the state tournament to get to nationals now, which I love that because for me, I absolutely love the camaraderie of clubs, and I was in a bass club in lacrosse, and it was great experience for my life. Made a lot of friends that I talk to all the time to this day. And I respect those guys, but it just wasn't really for me because I don't have a ton of money and time off to like go four hours away for a club tournament to try to win a hundred bucks. Like I love the camaraderie, but I don't value it as much as I value my time and money, if that makes sense. And for that's sure. okay if that's if that's you and you do value it that way, that's fine. But that's just not how I value my time and money. I respect that. So this new format, they have a qualifier in lacrosse. So now it's like my mind is like turning. Like I, I think the Federation Nation Championship is a major, major tournament, major, major opportunity. I want to be there, and I have an opportunity to be there by doing well in lacrosse. And I mean, what could what better opportunity could you ask for? So signed up for that. That's in May, May eighth through tenth in lacrosse, and that's a, a lot of the best tournaments I've had are in the month of May in lacrosse. It's May and October, those are my. Those are my bread and butter. So Ooh, I'm really we like that. jacked up about that opportunity. I can tell. Yeah, I'm super jacked. jacked super jacked. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we got the BFLs. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip the first BFL because it's during the off limits of that nation tournament. Yep. Yep. So I'm going to skip that first BFL, but then I'm going to fish the remaining four, hopefully qualify on four tournaments to go to the regional. The BFL regional this year is also on the Mississippi River. It's... <laughs> But it's it's on pools like thirteen through seventeen or sixteen or it's like it's south down. I've never been down there. I've been on thirteen like once, but in the summer this is going to be in October. Totally new opportunity. Never been down there, but I I really like fall fishing on the river. Like I know what to do. I don't care what pool it is. I you know I know I'm going to find similarities and ways to catch them. So I'm super jacked about having a chance to go to that regional, and then the most the thing I'm most excited for this year is the Bassmaster Opens. I'm fishing all three in the Northern Division or the Division Three, which is St. Clair in it's July I think, early July, and then Leech Lake, Minnesota, up in your country, um, in August, and then September in Lacrosse. So it's going to be it works out great because being working for a school district, I get vacation time that rolls over in the middle of summer because our year is not the same as a, like a normal year. Our fiscal year runs from July 1st through June 30th. So I get a whole new set of vacation days before the Bassmaster opens schedule even starts. So it's perfect. I can use yeah. some of my vacation in the spring for that, the nation deal. And then the rest of my vacation for the next year 
in the rest of the season, if that makes sense. It does. So yeah, it's like the perfect freaking storm. Like I've never been signed up for four major tournaments like before the season. Even I mean, this is the earliest I've ever signed up for a tournament. <laughs> I'm usually the guy that even you know I obviously I'm gonna fish all the BFLs, but I still wait till like the deadline to sign up because that's just how I roll. Procrastinators, us, us folk. But it's it's kind of nice that you know I've already paid for them, and then I worked a bunch of overtime and paid it off. So like now all I got to worry about is paying the balance. A month out so it helps financially hopefully going to get some tournament winnings under the belt before that comes down so i it just it, everything is like flowing perfect towards this being a really good opportunity you know multiple chances to make a bassmaster classic going through my hometown yeah and you know i mean you can't beat that so i'm jacked up i'm gonna fish some team tournaments too where i can fit them in and i mean next year could possibly be the best fishing year of the life you know so who says it can't be? I'm I'm not I'm not counting myself out. You know, I, I wouldn't. Anytime you get an opportunity to bet on yourself, you should take it because that's a lot better than betting at the casino. I tell you what, because oh, you shit. can control your destiny. You just got to put your mind to it, your heart to it, and then you got to put in the work. Putting in the work's a big deal, and I know you do all those things, dude. And w- yeah, I'm excited to see how you do this year, and I know it's going to be a dude. It, fishing is a it's a blessing in disguise if you if you don't get what you want, and it's the best feeling in the world when you do. And I guess it you can't ask for a better recipe this year, dude. So I'm pulling for you, dude. I appreciate it. What are you fishing? Uh, Champs Tour and Team Trail, and uh, I guess uh, those are still bears. I I feel like uh, you know, yeah, I feel like I've got unfinished business on both those trails after last year. I had a tough season, so um, you know, not a horrible horrible season on champs tour but by no means a good season and team trail it was like one good finish and bombs which so i've got yeah a lot of cleaning up to do in my game i feel like and i'm excited i feel like i know yeah i'm ex- i'm as excited as you are i think and uh yeah, yeah. there's there's nothing better than when you're a, a bass fisherman in the north country and it's winter time and you got the time off from fishing and all oh. you get to February and that seems to be like when the blood flows and you're thinking and I, it's I don't that have anti- time to be have, like it's, yeah, you it's need that to- anticipation like now is when you start really and it's just the best vibes ever this time of year I feel like when you're just jacked up yeah. for the season and like all positive like yeah both of our seasons might tank but the fact that we have the optimism and the the confidence that they're not going to tank and we're going to do good, like it, it gives you something to be excited about at this juncture when it's crap weather and it's that constant hope of what's around that next corner yeah. of glory, right? That we've experienced, or you know, you've cracked that code and and that challenge of cracking that code was a long hard road, but you cracked it, and you know it can be cracked and you again. You know it can be done again. Yeah, and you yeah. And not doing it is as motivating as doing it. Hundred percent, maybe, and probably more motivating. Potentially more. Yep. For I'd me, say. More. I'd say definitely. Ask, definitely ask Jason Christie about that. He oh. just talked about it last week on Mercer about you know losing those two classics the way he did was honestly probably the best thing for him is what the way he worded it. You know, he thought it made it he made it that much it made it that much more sweet for him and also just drove him that much harder. And I think it built his brand, is what he referred to. It, it built his brand a lot more to have that kind of, that kind of chip on your shoulder kind of deal going on. So, well, dude, are you are you advocating for old school parenting, like good ass whooping? Yeah, a little. All that's kind of. I mean, like, think back to the beginning of this podcast, like six hours ago. Kids needs them spankings. Remember when I said I started off with a bang, and then I got my ass kicked, and that was the best thing for me. Maybe maybe it would have been better for me if I would have just only got my ass kicked all throughout. But either way, a guy's got to get got to get leveled a few times in this sport to have a shot. Doc prescribed me a year supply of ass whooping last year, (laughs) and boy, by golly, I hope it worked. (laughs) (laughs) That's good, man. I'm well. It's not good, but all right, cut that shit. What? I just fumbled my whole words. That's okay. What I was trying to say is it's not good that you didn't have a good year, but it's good that, you know, the ass whooping that you claim to have gotten that I don't think is really as bad as you thought. Mm. But 
it's the fact that it's driving you forward is is all that matters. Dude, it drove me to spend four or five days on the water every day this fall to lice up. Like it is the most motivating thing I've ever experienced. <laughs> That's awesome. I know when I came back from double zeroing at Grand Lake, like I was so pissed off and I fished like a madman. Same deal, dude. Like it's when you work hard and you don't receive. But yet you maybe you're just like it's not that you're not working hard. It's just maybe that it, how you think is such a big thing in this sport. And mentally, mentality is – we we barely talked about anything besides frogs today, Cade, if you haven't <laughs> noticed. Like, it's not <laughs> always about that, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, hard work's part of it, but there's there's a lot there's a lot to it, which is why I have a really important question for you. And I think we should probably – we want to start to close it out? Yeah. I think, from a yeah, timing probably. standpoint. Yeah. Okay. Which leads me to my next important question, which is... Okay. So you got a wing dam, a sand drop, and a backwater. Fuck one, marry one, kill one. Go. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I think I would probably fuck the wing dam. Okay. I'd probably kill the sand drop. As much as that hurts to say. I understand. And then I would marry the backwater. I got gotcha. you. For sure. That's that's beautiful. I love it. I, I'm holding to that, like, 100%. Because, you know, the wing dam's hot and flashy. Like, when it all works out and, like, yeah, you can, you can, you can make some shit happen. Yeah. On a wing dam. Best sex of your life. But, like, long term, that ain't the solution, pal. It's not sustainable. And the sand drop, that just, god damn it, I've won so much money off of fish and sand so, at times. But, like, again. She stole your money on the way out of the hotel room. Well, and like we talked about before, a, a giant bulldozer called the main channel of the Mississippi <laughs> River just sends down all this water and takes it your favorite sandbar away from you. So, as we talked about before, with the ignorance is bliss thing, if they just didn't exist and you didn't even have to think about that beautiful sand drop that used to be there that's now land or gone or now deep water that uh, all of it doesn't always make sense but if it just wasn't there and you never had to think about it so maybe just kill it and then the backwater it's like the backwaters are the blood and just the mother earth of the mississippi you get hit the least by change and flow like you you know well, hey, you're not always going to be there, but I know when you work I think, nights, you know, <laughs> like I know when you'll be there and you aren't going to change yeah. a whole hell of a lot. Right. I want to marry you. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. But the other thing is, you know, you look at a backwater, like what does a planet need to sustain life? It needs, you know, water and whiskey. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the backwater is like the lifeblood of the whole system. Really? Because. Well, it is. Yeah, I suppose I mean, every fish species on the river uses slack water. Yeah, yeah, for something. Right. Some fish tolerate more current than others, but even even like the most current tolerant fish tend to spawn in non-current. That's where greatness blossoms. Yeah. Pretty so tasty. I mean, without the backwaters, look no further than other rivers that have no backwaters and see how dead they are. Right. Go to the Ohio River sometime. That's fun. Yeah. Actually, yeah. it can be fun, but it, it mostly sucks. What's like a lake and a scenario you hate the most? Last question, I think. A lake and a scenario that I hate yeah, the most? Yeah, like you like a river, so does that mean you hate like Mille Lacs? No, or I love like, Mille Lacs, okay, but like, I've never been to Mille Lacs. Mean, By the question? I've only done the spawning deal on Mille Lacs, so I'm kind of a loser because it's like cheating, but it's, it's still pretty cool. Did you get your hero pick? <laughs> yeah, just, I did. Nah, I actually no. boxed them all. Box, even doubles. though it's illegal, I just, you know, I needed to get the hero pick. For sure, man. So I actually held up 10. A couple of them were in my mouth, and I actually put one on a stringer and then hung it from my freaking... Call it Instagram biology. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, on a serious note, I guess, um, geez. Like, what's the hardest scenario or what's the hardest type of water for you to break down? I'm trying to think of like some of the tournaments that I struggled in the most. 
Like, I always feel so confident, like, going. Well, you maybe broke that water down okay, but just didn't make good decisions. You right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. Because you don't maybe don't understand how that body of water changes like others or, you know, it, it could be, and, you know. I mean, I guess I would say that, like. Some questions don't have answers. I always love going to the Ozarks, but the Ozarks in the spring, when I think back to my career, haven't really been that friendly to me. Like March, I've been to Grand Lake twice, three times. I did good there in September when it was supposed to be awful, and I actually kind of liked it quite a bit. And I did good, and then I've been there twice in March when it was supposed to be pretty cool, and I fucking sucked both times. And and I don't know, something just doesn't jive with me on that place. And when I look back, I mean, even Lake of the Ozarks and. A little. I've done good on Table Rock in the spring one time, but then I also did bad there in the spring one time. So it's like, even though I feel like I'm a really adequate jerkbait fisherman, I can throw an A-rig, I can throw a jig, I like the style that it takes to catch them there, but for some reason, I can't do it yeah. very great yet. I mean, I'm working on it, for sure. My uncle's got a place on Bull Shoals. I went down there last year, and or I guess that was two years ago already, but went down there and messed with a few fish a couple years ago for fun so maybe i'll be back there to work on my ozark spring game a little bit more but yeah something about the way those fish move and i think i think the biggest thing that i have a hard time with there is my river rat innards when it gets warm and the backs of the pockets are getting nice and juicy and you know you i'll go find that that i will go find (laughs) 60 degree water when you're not supposed to and the fish don't find it. Sheephead do. It so you them. move. You move too. You move faster than. It them seems bass, like it. And usually, bass. what happens is I'll get a big bite. That's what happened to me at Grand. I got a big old pig on a spinnerbait decoy fish. Big old spinnerbait pig. The day before the tournament, up shallow, Fuck. rolling a spinnerbait around, and Led I'm like, astray. and that just told me that hey. I might not get very many bites, but if I even if I only get four, I knew it was going to be a tough, tough tournament. Like even if I only get four, even three, if I get three for twelve pounds the first day, I'm off to a pretty solid start. Right. Three days so, early to the yeah, wind. Yeah, I rolled that shit, and it and it rolled me up and smoked me. You know, so. Okay, that leads me to my last question. Officially, I think. Okay. Selfish. Sorry. I'm no. Selfish sometimes. I love it. Shad movements, Mississippi River. What have you learned about shad on the Mississippi and how they move and and different you know things about that? Might be a long question. Sorry. No, ah, it's all right. Um, just like bass populations, I feel like shad. There's like different breeds of shad. I mean, they're obviously all the same. The shad, like gizzard, they're gizzard shad on the sure, river. Sure. We don't have thread fins because they can't survive our winters. Um, gizzards are more hardy. Our gizzards aren't like the big Kentucky Lake gizzards. Well, let me preface that. We have breeding gizzard shad that are huge, like, and you don't see them very often. They seem to live in deep water, and they don't come to the surface a lot, like those big balls of bait that we see. Until it gets cold. Yeah, uh, we don't, no. even when it's cold, they seem oh, really? to stay deep. Like, sure, sure. you'll catch them below the dams and the spillways sometimes in, like, 20 foot of water. You'll snag them, and they're, when you catch one, I mean, they're, like, freaking 12 to, I've caught them as big as 16 inches long. I mean, they look ridiculous. They don't even have a black dot anymore. They just look like some sort of junk fish. But they're gizzard shad, and they're huge. And those, the the very small number of those that's in the river, they spawn so freaking many. Like, they lay so many eggs that it basically just, like, repopulates the whole river. And from what I understand, they can spawn multiple times. And and it's just, it's a pretty cool cycle that we go through on the river where, you know, you fish the river in April, May, June... And it, you would think that this place doesn't have shad. It must just only be like a bluegill crawfish place. Then all of a sudden, like late, you know, early to mid to late July, you might see like all of a sudden you see these little pods of minnows on the surface, little tiny things. And you get up and you realize they're shad fry. And then they grow like astronomically fast. Like in a month, they go from being pin minnows to being like four inches long. It's insane. And then by October, they're, you know, they're four to six inches long, and they're the fish are gorging them and getting fat. So that's kind of the cycle. But but just like bass, 
of you know largemouth and smallmouth you got some that prefer to live on the main river some that are more backwater oriented some that live in like deep backwaters that don't have any current too that's like a big deal those are the places that seem to have the biggest population of shad so like a dredged out area that's 20 foot deep no current a lot of shad like that's where they're being spawned that's where they're growing fast because there's a lot of stuff in the water and that Spawn dead over 20 foot just like on top yeah i mean they, they vary they go up and down like you'll yeah. go in there and some days they're right on the surface and the seagulls are going ape shit for them and then other days they're 10 15 foot down but usually they're always suspended in the water column just like a southern reservoir shad would be mm. um but then you know there's smaller groups of shad out in the current and in the sloughs and i mean i've seen before like little wolf packs especially like bigger shad like in the five to seven inch category you'll see those in smaller clusters of like seven or eight on like a sand point or something. And if you find that, you know, that's the kind of deal that produces like that freak bag. If, But it's really, really unreliable. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's what you're always looking for is like those larger than life shad. Mm. And but But generally, you know... <coughs> A deep marina, a deep backwater with no current, that's where the majority of the shad are being born. And then as the year progresses, you start to see these shad kind of peek their heads out, get more out in current, and they migrate. Sure. You know, some of them migrate up to the dam, and they all just kind of disperse, and, you know, they school up on wing dams, and that's when the fish will gang up on them on the wing dams, and, all you know, the whole buffet is out there on the main river in that august september period when the water's low you know this isn't a typical year everything obviously is so dependent on water level but a typical year we have lower water in late summer just by weather patterns and climate of the mississippi river upper mississippi river region yep yep and then as you progress towards winter they start to go back towards those areas where they spawned i mean that's just kind of the cycle and the fish just follow them back to those areas and it just so happens that those areas are usually good wintering areas no current deep water bait fish winter so you just follow the shad follow the migration pattern and and you can kind of put it all together with the seasonal migration of and that goes north or south or both typically. it can go both yep yep but but it, but it's typically one direct like it's a direction that way or the other up or down or both a really prolific wintering hole no, They're, I'm talking just summer movement. Like right when they're done, when the shag get done spawning, and they're oh. starting to move out to the river channel. There's a migration that happens, right? Yeah, and that can happen. They can go north, they can go south, or they can go both. Yeah, I think they go both. On I think they spread any system. out. Yeah. What if most of the shad spawn happens on the lower half? <laughs> have you noticed that? I guess have you noticed the shad spawn happens in a section of the river? I've definitely noticed there's been times when, like, one section of the river seemed to have more. Similar areas that they winter. Not necessarily. No. Okay, so they moved to a place. There's definitely places on the south end of Pool 8 that I can think of that they probably spawn because I see a shad movement on the south end of the pool at certain times. And if you can key into that when they're coming through, there's certain key areas where it's like you want to be there. But it's not really anywhere near where they're going to winter. I think those those shad are definitely moving north. So yeah, it's a it's a very complex, multifaceted question for it sure. Depends on the pool. It depends, it depends on, on like uh, the, it depends on so many so things. many things right? and where they're going to end that up. At when I asked it, you know, and I don't necessarily know that shad are as like hardwired as the bass. Like this but, is where I'm going to winter. You know, I think eventually they just like find a slack area and. There's a little bit of a trend with bass, though, where I've noticed they will typically kind of move, like, up a backwater to spawn, for example, up current. And then when they're done, they move down current. So, maybe north, south, for example. That's definitely, post-spawn fish, I've always kind of said that tired post-spawn fish like to go down current. And I was just curious if there was a correlation like that with shad. That much I haven't been able to really put my finger on for sure but i I haven't either which is uh, shad is like for us minnesotans 
unless till you go to the Mississippi, yeah. we don't deal with a lot of shad. So th- I wanted to make sure I asked that before we were done. So I appreciate that. And uh, I know we got to close this out because, you know, you can't. All good things come to an end. All, all good things must come to an end. And I Except think. Except for bass fishing. You know, this first inaugural service of our, you know, this, of the Old Testament has now concluded. Thank you to our congregation tonight. <laughs> But but I, I do want to share a little bit of juice with you since you've just been so gracious tonight. Um, have you heard of the Norris buzz bait? No. Okay. Waypoint, just like they got some in like a couple months ago, and the good buzz baiters I know have been speaking very highly of that buzz well, bait. Thank you for that nugget. Yep. And Is these that- are these are these are buzz bait prudes, like. Like if I could show them ten buzz baits and they'd be like, "Shit's trash." Like, like, does it have a skirt or is it a toad style? It's more about the blade. It's a unique blade, um, and it's a skirt style. But as you know, yeah, do what you want. Skirts can be modified. Gotcha. I will check it out. Yeah, dude. <laughs> but dude, thank you so much for making the trip. I don't have a beer anymore. How was your Minnesota Gold, by the way? It was delicious. I finished two of them accidentally. So they're they're good, dude. They're right yeah, brewed right in Cold Spring. So I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. I appreciate the free beer and kind of a sleeper. When you come to Lacrosse, there's always a beer cold for you in my fridge too. I know there's some beer I can try down in Lacrosse, so I'm looking forward to that and I'm definitely gonna take you up on that visit. You better. And you're gonna be back. So this is I will be extra special, dude. Drive safe. Uh, Bass Galaxy checking in, checking out Cade Laufenberg, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thank you, guys.